Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the Co-Optional Podcast here on the 16th of May, 2017. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. It's just, I like that slight, (laughs) slightly uncomfortable, awkward silence when James looks at these two overly enthusiastic Americans who doesn't really know quite what to make of it all. Well, it's like being the fourth wheel, though, when you come into your, I mean, not really. It really is. Just well, that that's you how know, you get around on four wheels, three wheels, and you're on a, like a tricycle. That's true. That's then we're a shit. tricycle. And yeah, no one wants to oof. be that. I mean, you could, I mean, TB will argue that Del Boy from Only Fours and Horses did great on three wheels. He did. <laughs> that he and that's did. a reference that they would totally not get. No. <laughs> Not I'm imagining true. all kinds of things, though. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> the reliant okay. Robin for people who can't no, afford yeah, a proper it, bike. It's, it's good, and um, I'm I'm really happy to be here. I've uh, I've watched the show a few times. Aww. So that's that's more than I'm, many, most of our guests. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. It's yes. like the follow-up question of that would be then why did you agree to come on then? <laughs> well, I self-deprecation comedy. Hey. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I'm trying to challenge myself this year. Ah, with, yes. Uh, Solution. Do things that put, make me uncomfortable. Indeed, uh, put yourself in uncomfortable see. situations to broaden your horizons as a human being. Yes. Uh, yeah. I must yeah. say, you've got an incredible amount of people subbing and being subs in your channel. Yeah, we never quite figured out why they do that. You weren't even live, and people were subbing. Yeah. What do you call them? Because they've all got little hats. Nothing. We don't call them anything. We They're actually top act- hats. We They're actively discourage that behavior. Actually. Hats. I want yep. to call your subscribers complete cookies. As a, a, a there are worse things you could cuckoo. call them. Yeah, <laughs> yep. for subscribing. Feel free. I I'm hope that does not get adopted that on a more permanent so, basis. Wait, that is so cute for TV though. Like, really? I just want that to be a thing because little TV little is cookies. so just like serious and composed. And then he's like, "All right, my little cookies. I'll All see right, you cookies. on the next game." <laughs> Kill me now. <laughs> Ugh. Find my little cookies. <laughs> Find my little cookies. Oh, Be good. No. Be Smooch good. your mom. Do you realize oh. what you've done here? <laughs> little cookies. God damn it. This uh, someone, episode someone of the- also called themselves biscuit bears. <laughs> oh, they can go to hell on that one. That's only Sky is allowed to say that. He's the only person. <laughs> oh, whoa. All right. I like, you know what? Those the fact that one person's allowed to say it, it works. Yeah, yeah take them's it. the rules. I would not have thought you even allow one. He's the only person I tolerate that says it. And that only barely. Only ha. barely. Ah. Ha. Take that, Sky. This episode of the Corruptional Podcast is brought to you by Audible. Head on over to audible.com slash cynical. That is not cynical, but in fact, it's audible.com slash cynical. There we go. Corrected the title. For your free audio book, feel free. We're going to be talking about some audiobook recommendations a little bit later on in the show. We'll be listening mm. to a few. We've got some good ones for you. I don't think you really have to guess what Jesse's is going to be, considering what it's we've been Star Wars. constantly <laughs> mentioning the last couple of months. Yep. I had to hand that one over to him. I had to I had to get a proper book. He's like, no, I'm talking about Thrawn. All right, fine, sure, you can have it. Look, I just got uh, American Gods, though, so that's a, that oh, is my first so good. non-Star Wars purchase. I'm very ready for it. Dude, Indeed, you're cultured now. I still now. have not watched that yet. Like, I've heard want, that the wanna, show is amazing, and I've never read the book, so I'm just like, oof. I want to read it, or first, or listen to it first and then jump into the show. I think that's my plan. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Does he read? Because I know that like Neil Gaiman did uh, the readings for some of his other books. Does he do the narration for American Gods? I can look right now. Please do. Uh, I have Norse mythology as well. Neil yes. Gaiman. And uh, Listen I just to that got one. that. It's so good. He does narrate that one, but I don't see who narrates this one, which doesn't make sense. Hold on. I'll find it. Well, I do that. Mm, good Everyone question. should totally be quiet. It, it's no, it's narrated by a bunch of people. Yeah. There's a ma- there's like a real cast to it. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. that's interesting. There's a full cast. Yeah, yeah. That's I've why l- it didn't tell me oh. who it was because it's multiple people. Yeah, it's not like a play or anything. It's not like an audio drama. I've listened to a bit of that audio book, and it's it's just read in the normal way. It's just got a couple of different people to do it. I gotcha. Yeah. That is my car rides now. Is just books. Pretty much. I haven't listened to music in the car in maybe four months i don't remember what music sounds like i don't know what it is anymore (laughs) i've been jamming out on that new gorillas album real hard so i've been i've been deep in the music but yeah music and podcasts are my thing i don't really listen to books in the car i listen to books like clean oh i could see i like listen and focus in car i zone out and i can focus on it if i'm doing anything else 
I'll be three chapters later and be like, what the fuck is Rewind a second. Fuck? You just said, I'm in the, I, when I'm driving at 70 miles an hour, that's when I like to zone out. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, but, you, you no, I stand by what no. I said. I stand by what I said. No, but the scary thing is, there are times where you're driving and you do zone out and you arrive at your destination and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> no, that's true. How am I that still alive? Happens. What, that's why, I that's will... why they, sorry. Go no, on. no. Go for it. I, I was gonna say that's why uh, that's why they say that most commonly accidents will happen really close to your house because that's when you feel like you don't need to pay as much attention because you oh, don't ride. Oh, there is time. also the fact that ninety percent of driving is done close to your house because there's also that. You know, you don't go on road trips every day, so there, there is that. <laughs> there was one time I was going <laughs> yeah. to go visit my parents, and I drove. It was nighttime. I was tired, and this to this day, I I, I make sure I'm awake when I like I can drive shit. I was driving and I vividly remember seeing a hill ahead of me. And the next thing I know, I was on the other side of the hill. I don't know where that time went, y'all. <laughs> I'm I think I, I think I avoided death or was kidnapped by aliens, one of the two. Because I, mean, I am pretty sure I passed out and like woke up. I think like, you're oh. still alive as far as I'm aware. I'm Sometimes I'm not quite sure. That one, by the way. Yeah. I think aliens That's is fair. a much aliens. You can't, it's a much it's safer kind of version sense. of that story. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. one else was there to provide alibi, so probably. Why not? Perfect alien abduction. They know yeah. what they're doing, y'all. We'll just choose they're to aliens. believe it. Well, to the Corruptional Podcast, we do occasionally talk about video games. Our special guest today is, of course, the one and only James Too Good Harding. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. You've been doing a lot of interesting things lately. Uh, many people <laughs> might know you for your work on The Good Studio, for your work in various Dota tournaments. Uh, you used to, of course, be a Quake Pro and a Quake commentator. You're currently in the process of working on a game, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, we're working on... Um, um, it's quite funny, because we're going to be talking a lot about Quake, and we're we doing a, a game in a, a very... Oh, I don't know we're going to talk a lot about Quake. That might bore a lot wow. of people. Wow, but... wow. I mean, it wasn't the only presume. reason I brought you on here. So <laughs> yeah. I think, and it's coming up. Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the Welcome to a is, quick get, freezer, yeah, my friend. <laughs> I, I get, I get this feeling absolutely that Jesse, you might not be the biggest fan of esports. As is me? A yeah. No, man, I love esports. I think some of the people in esports are shitheads, <laughs> but esports right is one. great. Esports yeah. is fantastic. I'm a huge God. fan of of games and watching people play God. competitively. I remember really he great. got into it. He so uh, for your info, James, Jesse briefly owned a Heroes of the Storm team when Heroes of the Storm kind of first came out. Oh. Okay. Um, he ran Stellar Lotus, and it was both amusing and depressing to watch him descend into madness, really, experiencing kind of a, a naive, fresh-faced, I've never been into esports before, and then discovering how shit a lot of people in esports are no, in a very thing. short period of time. Like, people really don't know this about esports. Is like, everyone's like, oh, esports, yeah, everyone's got so much passion. But sometimes that's all they have. And there's very little education yes. that goes into, you know, the people that have been working in esports for a long time. So you really have to kind of figure out who's worth talking to and who's not. And actually, in esports, uh, currently, we're in a really kind of dangerous situation because we've had, like, such explosive growth from, um, you know, the success of Twitch and, yes. you know, success of Riot and Valve. And we've got like Blizzard and Overwatch doing stuff. And then you have to think like, who are these new companies coming in with a lot of money consulting with? Yes. Who are they talking to? Like, who are they talking to? And I think if you're um, if you're an actually good esports consultant right now, you really need to go out there and make yourself known because there's a lot of people that could be doing a lot of bad things. And one of the I think esports in its current state can definitely not have um, a lot of failure with uh, big big um, brands or franchises coming into it. It'll have a huge yeah, I impact. I don't, to, I don't want to talk about the Overwatch League right now. Um, but <laughs> well, there the were news. There was news over the last couple of weeks that. Blizzard were having problems selling franchises. There was a rumor that there was a $20 million franchise fee and that the contracts on that when it came to revenue sharing and rights were not yeah. favorable at was all. Was there any clarification on that? Blizzard did a kind of non-response. Kotaku po uh, yeah. put an article out about it yesterday that was supposed to answer the criticism that really only really boiled down to, trust me, guys, it's going to be great. That's kind of what they said. They didn't really confirm or deny anything. I uh, have nothing to say about the Blizzard esports <laughs> community. I'm just going to zip it and just say, you know what? Gonna just stick to the outside of that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> there are a other esports communities that are doing to... great. I just don't think, like, 
I think when it comes to Blizz, they have the added ego of we were StarCraft. We're what started this thing. The, the annoying thing about that is they were not the reason that Brood War got popular in Korea. Of course not. In fact, Absolutely. if anything, they were working against it. They weren't the guys that did that. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, they weren't... I, I, let's say the StarCraft 2 was a bit of a reboot, right? Mm -hmm. But they weren't actively... I mean, they kind of were actively working against Brood War in a way. But then you've got people like Mike Morheim, who, in my opinion, is just an absolute awesome guy. And, I 100% and agree with that. He actually traveled over to try and just meet the players and stuff like that. And even when I went over there, um, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I think he um, went over there to meet the pros and um, he turned up to a restaurant and there wasn't anyone there because Kesper um, told the pros that they can't go and meet him. Whoa. So there, there might that, have been... That um, sounds 100% just... like Casper. All the interactions I've had with Casper, so, they have been like that. So the that. thing is, you've got someone like Mike Morheim in the company, who honestly, I think, is one of the, the best people and cares so much about like esports and the competitive yes, scene. Absolutely. And then you've also got all these business decisions, business decisions that you have to make. But we should go maybe back to the what's happening in Overwatch now. So 20 million for a franchise... Uh, no share, uh, no um, revenue, um, share until revenue from like the Overwatch 20, until 2021. Yeah. Now, they're, they're talking to believe that Overwatch is still going to be yeah, around by then. Here's, here's the thing, right? I was just going to ask you guys the questions around this. It's like, um, you know, we, we might talk about Quake Champions in a bit, but it's like, are you playing Overwatch next year? I'm not playing it now. I'm not no? even playing it now. Yeah. I burned out in the okay. beta. So, and I don't think that it's very cohesive to watch either. I don't I enjoy hate watching, watching it. It's still, it's still, yeah, it's, the, I don't think they've even figured out how to properly show actual matches to the public. Like, even watching yeah, those is like, still difficult. And every time I bring it up, y'all, every time I've ever brought it up to anyone at Blizz, they look at me like I'm a <clears> crazy person. I'll be like, you know, I don't know why. When I they've watch heard this, that feedback I feel from like, everybody. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know the colors. Like, sometimes I have tell, like, trouble telling which character's which. Maybe it's just old man Jesse, but, like, it shouldn't be that hard to tell which team is which on this. And they're like, well, uh, no, it's not hard. I'm like, oh. It really okay. is. That, that sounds it's like they're style. living in a bubble. And then they look at me like I'm crazy, and I'm like, guys, I'm literally trying to help you because I love your company, but fuck are you terrible at esports <laughs> like, and, then, and then the other thing is is like they have this kind of fallback that they can be like well everybody thinks the game looks really pretty and great because they love our stylized you know universe and the mm -hmm. marketing of it so From even when you kind of want to do. criticize like the readability of the actual match and how it looks and the red you know lines and how big the particle effects are and, which is you know, a major problem again. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, every, you know, the general consensus is Overwatch is, you know, push the bar, you know, as Blizzard do once again on, you know, how games look, feel and, uh, and how they're presented. And they did a really good job of that. But like going um, to the Overwatch uh, thing with the 20 million buy-in, I mean, a long time ago, I had heard rumors that they were starting at kind of like one to five million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I was already kind of getting the sense that new teams coming in that weren't kind of, uh, you know, Dignitas, Fnatic, and all these big brands were kind of getting these slightly higher prices um, because um, um, it was like, okay, if you want in, you're going to be paying this price. But then, like, people like Dignitas and Fnatic were like, well, what the hell? You kind of need us for the legitimacy, you, yes. would, you would assume, right? We already so have they, a fan like, base that we're bringing with yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. So they're probably going to be like, hey, well, maybe we can uh, lower the price. So I heard a, a different degree of numbers that people were being told that they were to kind of get into the Overwatch League on. So the 20 million was the highest I had heard of. Yeah, I heard and... it because they do it by regional franchise, don't they? So yes. if they're selling a big city there and a big region, they're selling that at the premium rate. Yeah, yeah. So like, for example... Um, you know, like uh, you, you might have a team represent like uh, Miami, I guess, right? And, yeah, the, uh, you know, they're making it like sports, basically. Yeah, and then, you know, there's Miami Heat and uh, is there another Miami? Miami Dolphins? Maybe. But that, that, I mean, that's probably Are you talking about sport. location and there's Miami, Ohio? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm not sure they're in the major leagues for anything, but... No. It's Miami, Los Angeles. <laughs> but <laughs> this, this, is, this is where um, the 20 million gets really weird to me. It's because what genius do you have to be to go into a meeting and convince an NBA team or anybody to spend 20 million on your esports plan for a video game that doesn't do share revenue until 2021 
that has pretty okay viewership on Twitch, but certainly not the best because Blizzard have controlled the amount of tournaments going out because they, yeah. I felt they wanted to be very controlling of Overwatch because they did such a good job with the marketing and PR of the main game and how you know the stories and all the, the game evolved and had the fans around Tracer and all that yes, stuff. So they wanted to try and do the same thing with esports, so they were too controlling. And that's kind of let the scene down in tournaments. I mean, but then to go my into a tournament meeting, beats that's the concurrent viewership of us this year. Blizzard is you know? notoriously controlling in all their esports like that's a problem yeah but they still convinced someone to spend 20 million they must have convinced a few somebody people. There's, yeah there's like five there were a couple of rumors said that are in yeah and two at least two of them are connected to major sports franchises that already yes. exist that, yeah. those are the rumors that are going around yeah i i, I that boggles my mind because uh, the only sort of numbers that we've heard about buying into a league were there was a spot in LCS that was sold at one point and it was sold like, for what about one and a half million yeah. I think and that's a proven product in the objectively largest game in the world yeah, but like what what numbers are you selling like Jesse if you walked into that meeting and you're like right I'm gonna get these people to throw down 20 million are you selling your esport numbers where you're like these are the twitch streams no 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 you're selling everything you're like, selling I mean, the hype I, of the game. The, the way you're selling uh, Overwatch is you're not selling numbers, you're not selling uh, uh, viewership, you're selling passion. And you're selling the fact that this game is something that everyone knows, and it, or at least it appears that everyone knows it. It's yeah. a game that everyone's really passionate about. It's a game that, that we talked about on this podcast uh, back when it was in early, early beta that we knew it was going to be success because everyone was losing their shit over it before it even existed. People yeah, yeah. embrace the world that they created, which Blizzard is genuinely good at, and they they should stick to shit like that. They're good at creating worlds and things people love, um, and that I guarantee that's how they sold it, and that's probably how they got teams to buy in to the massive hype behind the game, which is we can sell you on four years from now getting money from this because it's so good and there's so much hype behind this it'll be around forever and it's gonna this get game, bigger and bigger and they yeah. the problem with that is you can make that the argument is like overwatch has a massive player base right now which it does they released mm -hmm. recent numbers which were blowing almost every other game out of the water that does not necessarily translate into passionate esports viewership right yes. At or all. money made out of esports. Yes. If you're making money, if your business model is making money purely out of esports, you're losing money because a lot of the times it's just a marketing cost. You know, esports yes, is. is like another game service. If there's any um, ad, re uh, sorry, um, kind of a split in uh, profits coming from the actual video game, like you know, like we do this as an esports model to promote the video games, new patches, and new champions. You know, make it interesting, uh, yeah. and people keep coming back and play. Which you can argue is what to LCS you, does, yeah, we're, and yeah, Valve we're willing does to as give well. you some money from actually game sales uh, and chests, and you know all this stuff. But if it's just this esports side of a business model that they sold these people on, I don't think that I think that's really scary. Yes. And then you've got like uh, teams already dropping out who've done esports for years and years, and I know there's actually going to be more teams. Uh, getting dropping out of Overwatch, um, a couple of big ones. Uh, I think one by the end of this month. And you know what kind of message is that going to send to like maybe these NBA teams? And what happens if these NBA teams get in and we get all this exposure and then an Overwatch leak just goes flat on its face and dies? I mean, the rest of esports will probably be okay, but I mean, surely that's something that will still be on people's radar. It like, will set back mainstream acceptance failed. from big brands for several years, I would think. It will definitely be damaging. And that's really what esports is trying to do and has been accomplishing to some extent over the last couple of years. We're extending out our sponsorship reach to brands that are not traditional gamer geek gear brands. You know, right. we don't, we're not, having tournaments that are not just sponsored by Razer, Steel Series, Logitech, fucking Monster Energy, all that kind of stuff. We're actually seeing products that are aimed at a wider demographic and are s very much more profitable. And that's what we need because that's where the big money is. I, I, I feel like the inherent conceit behind esports right now is that everyone sees it as a billion dollar enterprise. But for the vast majority of people involved, it's a losing money proposition. Yes, like yes. You're not making a cent off of it. Many teams are constantly losing money. That's why their their hands are in every pot. Like it, it the, it's it's insane to me that everyone sees. Oh well, this game had a X billion gross last year. It's crazy. 
there's sure didn't there's translate certain... to the teams in any way. Yeah. You know, it's like James was saying, are... like for the most part, these esport big esports ventures like LCS and like the International, they make money because it's tied directly into a game that the company organizing the tournament owns, which means they're able to monetize in a wide variety of ways and use the tournament entirely as marketing. And Valve in particular are experts at selling the the companion thing the companion every month yeah. uh, every year even and also selling skins and little in-game doodads related to these tournaments monetizing that way and teams do have a way of making money then through the game via their own cosmetics so yeah. at least they have a way to do that with starcraft in particular i know this is someone that did run an esports team and would have been in a much better position if there were a way inside the game for me to actually generate revenue the only way i could do it was with external sponsorship and external media that i've produced i saw the money going down the toilet and I'm like unless i took a profit share of actual prize money which in the scene was a big no-no you don't do that it's understood that all money goes to the players because they won it there's no way i am making profit on this it's never gonna happen no, it's it's a every business model that I've seen in esports outside of being the game developer is a very very risky game. Yes. I mean, yeah. the game developer they benefit the most off it. Of course, and and you know I would just be very um, uh, cautious as a even if you are the game developer of what you're doing with your game in esports. And I think that Blizzard trying to do this Overwatch League. Um, you know, it's been pushed back and it, it's it's kind of getting this reputation right now. And I hope we can all be proved wrong and it's going to be, you know, absolutely fantastic because, you know... Nobody here is wishing for that see, to fail. Yeah, seeing Blizzard, um, you know, uh, be successful and, and there's a lot of pro gamers that have, you know, kind of put their, you know, heart... And Eggs in that basket, into, yeah. Yeah, in, into doing this. And you just hope it works out for them. But, um, you know, they need to be careful. And esports doesn't have to be the biggest thing for every game. There's no reason why Overwatch couldn't have been like, hey, you know, actually a lot of people just like playing our game. It's not as fun to watch. So yes. we're just going to tone down the esports and not have to do something like, you know, Riot or Valve. And we're pretty okay just making sure that we got monthly tournaments and lots of different regions. And we at least pin bring people back to Blizz uh, BlizzCon for grand finals. And, you know, and, and if it, starts to pick up pace because we're doing a great job telling stories and with production and people are more interested now in the players than they were before we can ramp it up but just going like well overwatch is huge people love tracer and it's um a lot of people search for overwatch porn in korea so this is going to be a really good idea not just korea <laughs> not just how dare korea. you not just korea how <laughs> dare you oh i'm sorry <laughs> In this office right here, <laughs> we are single-handedly yeah. keeping that shit afloat. Let's let's build a let's build a league that um you know can, Overwatch Four yeah, League, NBA Overwatch NBA. Waifu okay. League. Yeah. yeah, this monthly the rankings OP, on the top OPL. Waifu. It started right here. Oh god! Twenty years from now, when they tell the story of the OPL, it'll be right here is where it started. The, the ref There'll show. be black and white photos of all of us, like. <laughs> Dear Lord, look how nerdy we were. Oh god. <laughs> oh. Not outside of the porn for a second, because as, as soon as I'm sure that it exists, Rocket League may very well be an example of we've got an esports scene, but we didn't go full tilt on it, and our game's still really successful, and the vast majority yes. of people just play it casually, but there is still a strong competitive scene, but we didn't fuck up the game for either of these groups, and we didn't go full tilt on this. We just let it develop organically. But I mean, like, I've always assumed that the way that they're treating Overwatch is a reaction to having so many games that became very big esports wise without them like really doing much with them. And now with Overwatch saying, we want to make sure that we are in control of all of that, right? Like They've money wise, we want to make sure before. that we're the ones running this. They already well, have a lot of control in that regard. And hell, if they just, uh, going back to what James was saying, if they just used these external leagues as a great way to advertise their new in-game cosmetic content, they'd make a shit ton of money off the back of just that. Seeing mm -hmm. a pro player in a brand new skin with a brand new cosmetic is mm -hmm. marketing for that thing. If, if I had to do like a, a timetable of how I think this all went down, it, you know, they have the background of... Starcraft and just being like 
we were the big guys. We were the ones that everyone looked up to. We were what esports was like really about. And then as time went on, they sort of like faded away from that as people went to other places and esports grew into MOBAs and shit like that. And so they, I, I know they tried to put their eggs into, I believe it's called like Blizzard Heroes or whatever it was. And that like didn't really like show up anywhere. It was a and mod they, for they StarCraft for a while. Too, initially. Yeah, and then And then for funsies, they created uh, Hearthstone as like the casual card game, like, you know, like a small team made it at Blizzard and that shit blew up. And I think when that blew up, then they were like, all right, let's get this MOBA thing out. And they really heavily were like, all of our hands are in where we're going to direct this eSport for for, uh, Heroes of the Storm. And then when Overwatch comes out, they're equally in that too. And I think because of uh, Hearthstone sort of surprised, like, people want to watch people play this they were like okay well these next things that comes out we need to be heavily involved in like what's going on here and that's like not the way to do it if anything no. the, the hearthstone model worked like it, people wanted to see it and it blew up and that shit's still very very popular and them trying to force an esports league for both heroes and overwatch is crazy to me because yeah. that's not how it works that's like no hearthstone didn't start up, that it, way i definitely think starcraft that some not i wouldn't say pressure but in terms of as you said like the kind of reputation that blizzard had and what they've done for esports which has been absolutely amazing just by huge games, yeah games right that have been brilliant mm-hmm. um the kind of pressure that they's like oh you see riot and then riot are like okay we're gonna do um the first season of like whatever lcs and we're just gonna drop 90 million into it right yeah. and then all of a sudden lcs starts to really take off and it you know and yeah. it, it it's paid for every year and it it creates all these amazing storylines and you know creates all these uh mini ecosystems you know from players teams and stuff that you know as i said you know there was a lot of support from riot so that actually that was probably one of the best places to be in if you wanted to make money um in esports um and you know they then they see valve kind of do this stuff with dota 2 and you know how the compendium and how you know dota 2 surprisingly just keeps surpassing its um i it blows my mind that that happens every year (laughs) It's yeah, like, yeah. surely this is the year where that doesn't happen, right? And then it's like, oh, they did it again. Jesus. Yeah. And then Blizzard are like, well, we can do something like this, right? And then it's like, where do, you know, and they've really pushed it. And I even heard like uh, crazy stuff um, that at BlizzCon, um, uh, just gone, that they were kind of, you know, pitching this, you know, um, the Overwatch League to a lot of um, uh, people. And uh, they announced it, isn't e- it? Elon, Elon Musk was there. Yes, I heard that too. Heard the exact same thing. <laughs> Being told, like, hey, Elon, right? What about, we're doing franchises. So what about Team Mars? Where you can play against, like, San Francisco or something. Imagine it, Elon Musk having an esports team. The craziest thing that I think is Blizzard's biggest problem at the moment is their insistence, and I know this comes from WoW, because it, it, it and it's sort of like, it branches off from there. It's the idea that everything must be both casual and competitive and that is a line that is unfathomably hard to walk like it, it, it everything stems from there where it's sure we can have wow where you can have the easy stuff for the casual players and then the rating stuff but that's a mmo where there's a million things to do yeah and then translating that into every other game they've created since is bonkers town because you can't have a competitive esport that also is like it's a casual game though it's it casual and weird work. and random and fun and also <sighs> a million dollar competitive sport yeah i mean i've said this about hearthstone a thousand times hearthstone uh, actually kind of angers me i hate to say this because i i really like hearthstone and i i do actually enjoy watching a lot of hearthstone streamers yes i do too but then i go and watch a tournament right and it's like i'm watching this guy he's called dog okay yes and um i know he's dog, awesome. of course yeah, yeah and i you know i've only just kind of got introduced to dog and um dog sits down to play half stone and then he gets you know a couple of cards and he's like these aren't my cards mulligans gets another bunch of cards and then he's like well fuck these aren't my cards and then he has to play whatever and then the other guy is like i don't know like pirate warrior or you know something and it's just like okay if you don't get the card that you needed to save you from turn four or turn five you're fucked you're you're done right and it's like esports yeah um, it's the same thing you know, like it always and, became, and became I, a I meme just feel you bad know? for dog yeah you know he but went also, to this he tournament did, well, he did win a tournament though recently so i feel, <laughs> yeah. I felt that, happy that, for dog that does happen every now and again where it's like yeah someone won a big prize and then they never place highly in a tournament again like it happens to so many of these dudes and a lot of it comes down to yeah you can get totally screwed by things like just the mulligan 
by the yeah. deck you're up against. And they've tried different formats to even that out. But the problem is, I don't think you can build a format that will smooth the randomness over enough because the sample size you would need to get that would mean the series is so fucking long that you couldn't play a tournament around it. Yeah, isn't, right. I mean, isn't potential mulligan problems just an aspect of CCGs? Like, I don't know how you would even get rid of that. It is, as yeah. a potential I, issue. Yeah. Like, I, fuck, I got no land. I got um, no land again. I'm fucked, I'm fucked. I mean, yeah, that <laughs> like, was it. Being land starved was an issue in Magic the Gathering. Hearthstone tried to get rid of that, of course, by not having land. And there's quite a few, land. Yeah. Uh, few get few games have done it by having cards have a burn feature where you can play the card or you can burn it as a resource so right. you can avoid it that way but even though hearthstone did some of those things you still get fucked that way because the game has got a lot of hard counters in it and the game's also got a shit ton of randomness on the cards themselves random damage like there's a card that'll either win you the game entirely or lose it for you how I many mean, games have been comes- won by ragnaros it kind of comes back to what Jesse said, where it's a really hard um, a hard line to walk between, like, this is a casual game or this is a really competitive game. And I do feel that Blizzard, because of their reputation, and I, I find this when I listen to game developers, uh, very big companies talk when they talk about making games. They're very different from the indie uh, developers in terms of yeah. their philosophy. They're like, we're a really big company. We make games based on stuff that we know that works because we can't afford to fuck up and lose money. You know, we can't afford to fuck up because we're so, you know, essentially big. And then you look at like indie companies and you look at their games and how they, you know, create stuff. And they're like, well, we just do whatever we think's, you know, the best. (laughs) And so when I, you know, and, you know, as I mentioned, we've mentioned earlier, I'm working on like an arena FPS. And it's like I would I get like much more enjoyable inspiration of uh, smarter and, and cleverer game design from a lot smaller indie development teams. But then if I look at Blizzard, that's where you kind of look and you'd be like, well, this is how you need to polish a game. This is, you know, this is the feedback you want from your particle effects. This is, you know, how everything kind of comes together. And so I don't really look at Blizzard anymore as like, this is the really well designed esport game. I don't look at them like that at all. And I think like Valve um, and uh, Dota 2 is very competitive and, you know, sometimes not as casual. Um, it's, you know, definitely leans over more to the competitive side. But I think yeah. that, you know... They keep both... trying to make the game harder. Like the recent yeah. patch yeah. just buffed denying a mechanic that a lot of people have specifically said they hate. Yes. Like yes. It's like, yeah. great. They don't give a fuck. They're just going whatever direction they, that Ice Frog and his team thinks is right. And then that's what I was going to say. I was going to say that's kind of, you know, credit to Ice Frog and the people that he's obviously working with on on the game in terms of, you know, how they balance it, that they're not, you know, they don't seem that scared about, like, trying to please everybody. They've really, you know, chosen um, what the game is and kept it there. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, you can understand why Dota's still awesome and everyone's still very passionate yeah, sure. about it. So, yeah, so it's, as, you, as you mentioned, Jesse, it's a hard line to walk. And I don't think we should be looking at Blizzard at the moment on the best the inspiration uh, to do it esports no i think they make the best games in terms of polish in my opinion and then other companies might be able to do they get uh, their fingers in answer. to many pies and they're really weird because it's a company that i've worked directly with and i'm still working directly with and i see the complete other side of that where they're just here's some money we know you can make a good product something unusual here's the money to do it go do it and in the case of my tournament they let me do it on the blizzcon main stage and it's mm. It's a tournament that whose format is, by design, fucking unfair. Without a question. It's a best of one, king of the hill. You lose once, you're gone for good. Plenty of people come into that tournament and win zero dollars. They, I've, we, The last game, of uh, two, it was a few months ago, of the tournament ended in three minutes, six seconds. It was just a rush, and the guy lost, and that was it, and that was the end of the event. And wait, wait, wait. What, what, what game did you say? Starcraft? Starcraft 2, yeah. yeah. The, la- the last game of my King's Tournament ended in three minutes, six seconds. Yeah. And the, how, what was the price money distribution? Was it? It's said... a $7,500 tournament that's 350 bucks per map win. Oh, so, okay. That's so cool. the guy that won that won $350 in three minutes. Nice. Not a bad rate. Uh, but and they just let me do that and they have they don't micromanage it at all Mm. at all they just let me do whatever i want so i've seen the other side of that but as you said it seems like the big corporate aspect of it and i imagine activision has a lot to do with this i was gonna say something but yeah are very (laughs) controlling and very corporate very shiny we want to do it like real sports and then there's the other 
side of it where it's like, no, we support the independent efforts. We support grassroots. You do what you want to do, you know? So it is a, it's a weird contradiction. I mean, there's a lot of good people in Blizzard anyway, so... I think, no I think doubt. Yeah. With, <laughs> yeah, I think your store with Mike and... and at its core, Blizzard is a lot of really great people who are trying to make really great games, and they are good storytellers, and they, like, they're doing good things. I think it's still a giant company, and overall in giant companies, they always end up being like a monstrosity that is uncontrollable and is like everywhere do, making choices that are insane because it's so big, and that's just like life. But I think like at its core, everyone in it is still really great people. It's just... I want to like reach to them and be like, I know in you there's a spark. Help me ignite it so we can get back <laughs> the blizzard that I know and love, please. Right? Like I just want to yeah. grab them and shake them. But it's one of the um, interesting things that might come of this and and seems to be happening is that um we because we, we've been talking quite a lot about esports is that because the Overwatch League is losing a lot of momentum and teams are dropping out of it, we now have Quake champions around the corner just which is looking up on to them. do a team mode for esports yep and you know uh, potentially a 1v1 so it this might be a quite a nice thing for quake champions to have because you know there's only so many um you know there's only so much time that you want to spend maybe watching esports on a weekly basis and when you you know if overwatch doesn't seem that impressive but now there's this new thing quake champions coming out that's new and there's new players and you know it's always interesting to see who's the best at a video game in a very early stages of its development so, so how how is that any different from blizzard ham fisting and esports aspect of their game with this new quake game coming out that not that many people have had a chance to play and they're already talking about having esports in their game as well um, I think Quake needs esports, though. I don't think Overwatch necessarily needs esports. So I think actually Quake is under a little bit more pressure to do it. Um, right. But it depends on the scale that they would do it in Quake. I mean, I, I I don't know how many of you did you get to play any of the Quake in the beta. I mean, I'm I, sure I, played, played I played a bunch Quake. of it. Yeah, we'll probably get onto the main meat of that gameplay after the break. But let's talk about the esports aspect of it now, since we're already on esports as the topic. Yeah. <laughs> We're already yeah, deep yeah, in this. We yeah. might as well just. Yeah. I mean, Quake was obviously one of the original esports, and um, so everyone's kind of expecting it, right? Uh -huh. But what we don't know is the scale of Quake's esports. So, for example, um, and this will actually the esports and how big it could be might have to coincide with, you know, again, the success of the game. It's like um, if you look at a, a small game like Battle Rights, uh, which is a, a little um, kind of a arena skill-based um top-down great game. Uh, brawler really game yeah they haven't gone crazy on esports because they're like well we we sold a lot of copies but if we you know want to invest two million dollars into esports trying to like look like we're a riot or a this and that and the other we might end up burning this money and not getting the players back so they've kind of taken their very small steps on a weekly basis and they run weekly tournaments and they try and make sure their philosophy is is we try and put as much money into the um the hands of the the players that play more so right now than blowing up the production just to look good so that if we do feel that there's growth and we do want to run a tournament like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand we've already given those players that have been winning quite a lot of money that they can then take the next logical step like you know and feel comfortable going from we've played online for six months winning bits of money and oh there's a right. land tournament right and then quake champions has a reputation so it's gonna in my opinion it's gonna have to come out with like a, a million dollar tournament if it wants to step into esports because for people to take quake champions seriously um going into esports you kind of want the the prestige and the you know you've got a reputation because you're quake i think Is if they come out with like five thousand dollar tournament or a ten thousand dollar tournament or no kind of big world championship you know off in the, the future it might dwindle a little bit too much for its genre because Quake is a great game to watch, but not always to play. <laughs> is, is, is there, is, is there, Sorry, I, I, I know, <laughs> no, no, it, it, I, there's definitely the unwritten rule of bigger money tournaments mean that it's more important, but is there a reality in which they didn't have to do that? Where they could be like, it's, it's Quake, yo, like come have fun and let's have a tournament. Or do they really need to like come out of the gate you're like, yo, we drop in cash bombs. It depends what they want to achieve. I personally think that Quake won't make as much money 
in general as they expect it will. It's going to be free to play. Um, so there's no kind of, you know, instant, you know, kind of cash grab, you can call it almost. From well, I mean, there this. is because you can buy it for 50 bucks, which gives you all the champions and yeah, then in like, future. But, like, okay. Is there any champion, Total Biscuit, that you played in Bay that you were like, I've got to have this? I'm spending money to have, you know, I like they're not they don't feel like Overwatch, you know, in terms of like when You're you right. play Overwatch, yeah. you get like really into like how you play the fantasy of these champions. But in Quake, you can't they're not so different. No, they're not. You're right. Although I think I think the attitude of quite a few people, maybe I'm in the big minority here, but I like the idea of buying once and never having to really worry about being nickeled and dimed again. And okay. for me, I would buy the 50 buck box for Quake Champions and just be happy with that. And I wouldn't want to run on that free to play treadmill. I find that frustrating. Well, I hope a lot of people do buy the game because that that will probably enable them to do more with you know future development um, and also esports. But my worry is is that they want to announce like this big kind of thing and they go like, oh, we're doing a million dollar or two million dollar tournament, right? And it's not just like prize money that you're putting down, you're putting down production costs. So any if you're spending a million dollars in prize money, you're sending total about $2 million, you know. To actually make the thing look good. Yeah. Of esports where you fly in players and you give them hotels and you treat, you know, because it's, you're trying to get the players to play your game and be, you know, stars so you can use them as a marketing tool or just be an awesome developer depending on how you look at it. Um, and then, you've shipped your game and you're free to play it's arena fps game which is a suicidal game to make for any company <laughs> uh, in my opinion you're making it not with a small team you're making it with id software which is you know very happy that they did really well with doom but it's still they're quite a sizable company and then also uh saber which is uh, a russian company that I probably had like 30 people or so i don't know making that up maybe uh 30 people or so work on the game and what happens if you don't make as much money as you want and you just dropped a uh, two million who uh, who at like bethesda or zenimax is going to be like so uh we did this two million dollar tournament you know total cost or whatever or and we seem to have got viewership on twitch which was around 20 to thirty thousand concurrent viewers we haven't increased our sales. And so what's next? And someone goes, oh, yeah, we want to run another $2 million tournament. <laughs> yeah. And it's well, like, it, like to at some point, that. it takes, like, there's people in those big companies, as JC said, like, with companies, you know, when they get big, they become these, you know, machines. And there are people that are hired into these big companies, not only to, like, do projects that make money, but to look at projects and stop them from losing money. And yes. it takes right. one person to kind of be like, what the hell's going uh, on? Here? Yeah. And so I worry that if they go big and they don't get their kind of initial push or reception from the, the community and, and growth, that it might be like we start big and they dwindle and, Implodes. and and it's yeah, it's one of those things when if it's not growing, you know, they say if it's not growing, it's dying kind of thing. Your company well, or your brand. I think that's that's Quake's biggest it's going to be Quake's biggest issue in general, just because uh Aside from name recognition that Doom, for example, got, or uh, uh, many games now rely on, uh, and that built-in audience of people who would automatically day one go get it, the audience, other than that, I like. where do you see that growing? Because there's so many other games that fill that, that need in people that right now they have to, you might be right, they really have to go like crazy and push a lot of money at, at people to get them to to love this game mm. it's it's a tricky yeah. tricky prospect because i think if you look at the weird growth of csgo when csgo first came out it was a fucking disaster in terms of adoption it was cs source level of competitive players fucking hate it like people were saying this is doomed there's no way and but they managed to pull it around mostly just by making very smart decisions and then by getting good support of big esports organizations like ESL and then putting their own money in as well. And of course, very smart, the introduction of cosmetics and to a side where they're like, we totally don't know about this gambling. Now, there's an aspect of that in there as well. I wonder if Quake has to grow that way. If it has to be a game that gets a lot of viewership consistently on Twitch from a bunch of big streamers, which is always a good way of encouraging people to play it at, I don't know, it's but, tricky. But Quake is such a unique game to enjoy as well. Like you have to understand, like if we both if we all play Quake together, we're essentially all playing very different versions of the game. 
even if we're playing on the same map together, right? Because we're using, you know, very different mechanics. It's we're not playing as a team. If we all play Overwatch together, we're playing the same game. You know, no matter what our skill is, you know, we're we're pushing in the same direction. The decision making is is very team, and it's it's very you know easy to do. But if I put a player into um, like a Quake game, and if they can or cannot strafe jump, if they can or cannot circle jump, if they understand the value of armors and control, or you know which weapons do what and how to fight with these weapons, you're you know, everybody knows how to use soldier's rifle and what soldier can do in his kit and what soldier's job is when you get into the team. Like, I don't see a new player try and do something weird with soldier, like just running around and healing people like he's a support player, right? And I, Yeah, you, you don't see people playing yeah, him that way, yeah. You know, it's like, it, it's very cohesive, but like in Quake, there's all these hidden roles to actually play the game at a high level. And when you actually can play Quake at a very high level, you're playing what I think is the best kind of most enjoyable um, competitive game out there, but everyone play is playing such a different version of Quake, and yes. even that might, you know. So it's it's very difficult to be like, yeah, you should play Quake, and they're like, you're like, you know, and the guys like, why? And it's like, well, it's a shooter. And it's like, well, it's, it, yeah, it is, but it's also it's, you know, are you playing Insta Gear? Are you playing Clan Arena? Do you enjoy free for all? A team deathmatch are you, you playing know, duel sacrifice. all that kind of thing yeah. which character you're playing you know it's not like when you play overwatch you're like hey let's go we, you know when you say let's play overwatch you know what you're playing when you say when you say let's play quake and not quake champions and you say let's play quake you know you could really just be into clan arena which is a game mode where you spawn with all the weapons and you can rocket jump and not do any damage to yourself and once you love clan arena you don't care about playing the other game modes and so quake to you is clan arena and quake to this person is another game mode and another game type and uh you mm. know so it's 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 so many different things within one game so you know getting a community to focus uh, and bring the community in behind one game mode or you know one esport is a very a challenge hard to do. Mm. so can i ask a question about a, a point that we were making about overwatch earlier do you think that um that they are having success putting together a spectator mode for uh, Quake that will help with that? I think Quake is a lot better to watch already. Than I agree. Overwatch. Having had yeah. to commentate it and knowing nothing about it when I did commentate it, I didn't feel overwhelmed <laughs> doing that. Yeah. I, I was know probably Dick, still shit. But, I figured it out. <laughs> but if I tried to pull that even after playing a ton of Overwatch, I would have been hopeless. It's so hard to see what's going on and therefore deliver that information to the viewer. Right. Yeah, Quake has definitely got a nicer pace to it to commentate. I was about to say, is it kind of like slower pace? Yeah, what more methodical? Is, yeah, what happens is in, in Quake, you get like similar to Counter Strike, you get waves of entertainment. It's not mm. a constant like two teams standing off against each other. I know that over, um, sorry, Overwatch does kind of have those waves of entertainment when people drop a lot of ulties. But if you imagine Counter Strike, that has like really strong waves of entertainment where it's all kind of chill right now. It's the buy, you know, everyone's buying, or it's a pistol round, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, get big right explosion of action. And then yeah. it's explosion of action, and then it kind of calms down again. And it's the same. Yeah, with that's and why it's it's always been frustrating when people say, "Oh my God, I don't understand why." you know, a, a game like Counter-Strike can figure out spectator mode, but Overwatch can't. And I'm like, well, but the pacing is completely Not different. The They've had years to work on the spectator mode for that game. Like, it's just too different. Two very so, different things, yeah. Watching yeah, dual I, mode in particular, which, and this is the interesting point, because we don't actually know whether Quake Champions is going to focus on dual or their new mode, Sacrifice, which is a four versus four kind of spin on Capture the Flag, could okay. also very easily be their esports mode of choice. We don't know which one they're going to go for. Maybe they support both. Maybe the viewership and community gravitates towards one or the other, or maybe they gravitate towards something that they haven't thought of yet. I think they're probably end up focusing on those two. And I actually think that they did a really good job with Sacrifice, and we can talk about that maybe later after we... Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll dive into a few other games that will kind of come back yeah. around to Quake towards the end of the second hour, because I really want to talk about my experience playing it. Yeah, and... Um... But yeah, as I said, in terms of spectating Quake, um, the only real problem it has in a spectator of outside of the 1v1 is that Quake doesn't force you to play next to your teammates. Quake players don't actually like being in the same room as each other, like too close to each other. They're very antisocial people, maybe. But the idea is they can also get hit with splash if you do that, right? Yeah, so. yeah. When you're on a map, you want to control the map. So to best control the map, you want to take as much as possible on the map. 
and armors are spaced out, weapons are spaced out, and the only times that you really come together is when you're trying to achieve, you know, um, an attack together on, or, or an objective. So that's where the, the the waves of entertainment comes kind of from. You know, it's like there's a buildup of collecting, and then there's a, a big attack. You know, and action. There's always mm -hmm. a, a victor or loser, and then it kind of happens again. So Quake does have a very natural. Um, you know, it lends itself naturally to esports spectatorship, and it has, in my opinion, always been bigger as a spectator uh, esport um, than actually sometimes a video game. Especially since Counter Strike, you know, back in like '99, you know, started chipping away <laughs> at the arena FPS or Quake yeah. scene, and then it, you know, one and then six. ate it basically yeah. ate whole. You know, mm -hmm. there's very little sure. left of that, and we'll see whether or not it can be revived. There's a few games that have tried it. But the the one the best thing about right, okay the best thing about Quake Esports that I can say is maybe if it's not the game it's the players and the stories behind the people playing it they are absolutely insane the <laughs> awesome people you've got like some megalomaniac narcissist from Russia called Kula right who goes into <laughs> interviews and he sits there like he's Putin and he's opposite his opponent and he's just like you shut up. I am talking it, you know, basically like <laughs> telling to the face of the guy that he's playing, he's like educating him how to play the game and why he's beating him in a live interview. <laughs> and, and you've just got like, and then you've got this guy called Toxic from Sweden, who's like this, um, I mean, I, I swear the guy doesn't eat, he just does like an oil change every day because he's actually a machine and he just turns <laughs> up to tournaments and he, he kind of sounds a little bit like a Swedish Terminator and he's got the world's <laughs> best aim. And he, it's just like, you couldn't make up these people in terms of who they are and so when they get on a stage together and they play they are you know the stories behind them and what they've done they're just so fun to follow and the grudge matches and they bring out quake brings out so much personality and the difference of gameplay between these players that it's very easy to go into the match and you say like okay this is toxic versus cooler you've got the crazy russian who you know you know is like just you just know, super bm yeah. all the super time BM. <laughs> <laughs> wants to outthink his opponent and, and you know make him look stupid and you know he does that a lot of times and then he's up against the terminator swedish guy with the best aim in the world who's you know it sounds a lot like the fighting game community in i was respect. literally yeah. gonna say yeah, I, I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why the fighting game community is so fun yes even if you have no idea like any of the strategies about street fighter or any of those games right like every person who makes it big in the fighting game community has such a strong personality yeah. right like they all stand out in such specific ways god i wish starcraft was like that trying to get an interesting <laughs> quote out of someone in an interview after a match is like pulling teeth <laughs> it's like you you just so how do you feel about winning thousand cool. dollars you just crushed your opponent in about 20 minutes flat three zero dominant performance You've been having real trouble against this guy prior to this. You lost 17 best of threes, but this time you came in, won a best of five like nothing. How do you feel about that? As a, I, I am glad that I show good games. Thank you for cheering for me. <laughs> I will show you more good games. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, every, oh, no! <laughs> every eSport needs a few good villains and a few mm -hmm. good heroes. Mm -hmm. and we lost it, all of ours. They're all gone. It sells everything. Evo is only as hype as it is because of the people who play in it. And they are, they range from like total assholes to like some of the nicest human beings who you're like, they finally won. It's one of those moments where at the end of every, like that's a tournament that you fucking can get behind because it's yeah. so hype and it's because yeah. of the people. And you can get behind then, it without even knowing that because that personality right. will come out on stage. You'll immediately, maybe someone says something and you immediately hate them for the rest of the fucking tournament because of that. Yeah. And you're rooting yeah. for them to lose. Yeah. You've got an investment yeah, you now. Emotionally connected. And yes, and, that, and that's I, where I it all is. One of, the, one of the best things that Valve started to do a little bit more was start telling the stories around the players. I agree, and I do 100%. Riot did that very early on. Um, there was a company called Zoom HD that was in New York, and uh, they actually did a documentary on Fnatic. And actually, some of the people there were, you know, moved over into Riot in the very early days. So they kind of knew what esports was, and they started telling the stories around the players. And I think a lot of success that Riot's had is through the stories of yes. the players and why yeah. it's interesting. Starcraft's was... tried that a little bit. And I mean, we, we saw the benefit of that directly, actually. We had a player on our team who was a rookie uh, called Impact. He is first foreign tournament. We sent him to DreamHack Bucharest. And just before that, a documentary came out uh, called State of Play. It focused on three people. Mm -hmm. Jadong was one of them. He was the main focus. Everyone knows who Jadong is. Impact was another guy. 
he was sort of shown as the semi-pro wanting to be great. And in the interviews that they did with him, he said, my dream is to face Jadong on stage and beat him. And you know what happened at Dream Act Bucharest? He faced Jadong on stage and beat him. You know, the, it was, the thing was filmed years before when Jadong was still playing Brood War, and it would have never happened in Brood War because Jadong is a living god. But right. outside of that, you know, and there was a story, and immediately this faceless guy who had never got any exposure before yeah. suddenly has a story behind him, and people start rooting for him. And there's so little of that in StarCraft that it really sucks. It really hurts the game. And the, if you're a game that has that, you will do so much better because you will invest yeah. the viewers in the story. I think it's, I think it's I mean, even... catalysts in terms yeah. of... I agree wholeheartedly. The important as an esport is the storytelling mm -hmm. behind the players. Yeah. Because... I mean, I like Counter-Strike Go and I haven't watched a lot of it, but funnily enough, one of the things I am watching in Counter-Strike Go is a reality TV show in Sweden where they've got um, a bunch of Counter-Strike Go wannabe pros in a house 24 seven. They've got two coaches, Ints and Spawn, which are old world champions, one for NIP and one for Fnatic. And they have to train in there. They have to play in there against each other. And the reason that I'm connected to the, the show, and it's called Gamers, is just because of the storylines of getting to know these players. That's and what super doing. compelling. And, yeah. and I'm just like, I really want this guy to HN. He's called HNS, you know, to like do really well. And then he's got like an opera on his team, you know, called ELO. And I actually care about them just because of the experience exposure that they're getting and i'm more in tune I'm, I'm more likely to watch that match of counter-strike in the evening than i might be an esl tournament because i've seen every esl tournament well, yes. well yeah because like you know tb was mentioning starcraft starcraft used to have a lot of characters right? we used like, to have idra um, we had naniwa we had a couple of guys even in the koreans mc you know probably yeah. one of the most well-known and most successful starcraft 2 players had a huge personality and people tons, love to hate him yeah yeah, you had tons of these these people who are very recognizable in the scene. And I, I do think that you guys are right that like they become such a big catalyst for whether or not people watch this stuff because they all started pulling out around the same time. And yeah. suddenly like people when, had no one to root for. Yeah, when the big guys came over from Brood War, that gave us a big boost. But a lot of those guys have just gone back to Brood War now. And of course, with StarCraft Remastered on the way, they're never coming back to StarCraft 2 in a million years. So yeah. we're going to happen. And here's, um, and one of the things that uh, Jesse mentioned about the people in esports not being great. This is what happens hmm. when someone starts to get famous in esports. No one controls the amount of exposure and media that these people get. So when someone becomes interesting, what happens is, is everyone in esports who's got a news site or has a, you know, a camera, a tournament and wants an interview, they all go for the same person because they're like, you're the interesting person from the last tournament. Yeah. And then this person's nice and they might not have someone who's good at PR with them or they might not know how to control it. And then what happens is, is we get, we, you know, we get drilled about this person. And so all of a sudden they were interesting and they were fantastic and entertaining. They've been overexposed. Really awesome. And now they've been overexposed. Now we're bored of their storylines. Uh, and the people running the kind of, um, you know, evolution of, you know, what's going on in the tournaments are they're like, well, everybody likes this player. So let's do another so thing book on this player. Yeah. And we start losing, you know, it, it becomes less and less interesting because people don't, con you know, control their God, themselves. This, this is the exact problem that WWE wrestling is currently having. Massive overexposure <laughs> of certain people that were fucking okay. bored of them. Yeah, because they're on television every week. It's got the point where the live crowds actively boo these top guys and chant insulting things at them. Because like, we are sick of you. We want to see somebody new. Fuck off, basically. It's, it's not the like they don't have problem. plenty of people that they could like Well, bring the in worst thing about like in the wrestling, they have no excuse because it's all scripted. It's all yeah, contro exactly. hyper control. They I can mean. take somebody off TV for any reason, whenever they like. But in real sports, you can't just get rid of the star player. You know, he's going to get those interviews and he'll be overexposed because he's that good. And yeah, people will start to actively hate him as a result. But at least the, the point is that at least they feel something for that person. And Absolutely. You're never going to have yeah. a successful scene if nobody as a spectator is emotionally invested in the outcome of a match. And that's but only going to happen if they care about the people. The crazy thing that I think is really interesting about esports is that its desire to mimic non like Real sports, sports. sports. Yeah. yeah, its desire to to mimic that is very very high, and they do it in ways that are superficial and totally not why they don't like capitalize on why you know mainstream sports is so popular. Yes. They'll do things like 
Like they'll it'll be flashy as shit. They'll do the the like oh, intense the poses, yeah. right? They'll do all the things that are superficial to make it seem serious. But go watch any real sporting event. It, it, it's the idea of before it starts. There's an hour pre-show where they are yeah. talking to players and interviewing coaches and like going behind the scenes and getting background information, like hyping up what you're about to see or talking about something else happening. But There's not all- even yeah. Not even there, but when you go to a bar, what's on us, you know, what's at bars, you're constantly getting little snippets of information about upcoming people, uh, you know, interesting things happening. Someone just did this in golf and constantly selling, selling, selling these people more than the sport. The the, the NFL draft, the reason why, I mean, a lot of people watch it because they're just like game theorizing a whole thing, but most of it is just the stories of these people being drafted into the big leagues and like this is where this person came from this is this person, kind nothing, of thing. and they work their ass off and now they're here or this person has an amazing story and you get behind it, you're like that's awesome that guy got drafted i can't wait to see what happens to him in the future and for sure like a smart move if uh, going back to the to the insane overwatch league if they were pulling stuff like that, where they were doing what their intention was, which was that story they showed at BlizzCon, which was like, this guy, and like he became famous, and then he failed, and now he's back. Like, That's exactly what they're trying to do, isn't it, with that damn intro video? Or what, I yeah. can't remember. Was it Crusher 78 or something? I can't remember yeah, what they called him. crazy name was. But that idea of that's what people care about. They're there for the stories. And the gameplay is is like what the extension of like, this is the, that guy's story. the gameplay is the canvas on which the story well i was about to say Absolutely. the story is painted and, and then I, just realized how stupid my metaphor was but you get the idea yeah no it makes sense yeah i've done like a full loop now but yeah In, no, indeed we've looped league, nicely back around is, if they take a lot of money and they focus on the storylines of the players they're going to do a lot better than just putting up a big amount of prize money putting up a big stage inviting people that we don't really know about they're going to have to work very hard to make me care about all the players coming from all the different countries before they even arrive yeah and then i'm i'm definitely going to watch you know and they've got a great uh you know a vehicle to get this information out um mm-hmm. you know, uh, what they they changed the name of it right it used to be called BattleNet. what is it now just blizzard it's just like, like the blizzard, blizzard launcher yeah oh, okay way worse <laughs> it's way bad. worse it's still battle on my computer always been battle yeah. for me. <laughs> right it's I still called battle on my computer too I and i'm like it. Yeah. It'll always- <laughs> hey, good, um, yeah, they're, they're so they're so silly for rebranding that. But yeah, you're right. They totally have the vehicle to deliver that information. We've been sh- screaming at them for years of, to use it for that for StarCraft. Well, I hope they-, they have the success with it. We'll see. Yeah, but, uh, I yeah, certainly hope so. Relaxed. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a bunch of really cool esports conversation. So those are the games that we've been playing. Uh, <laughs> when we come back. <laughs> oh, we'll get back to that. There's not a huge amount on the news front this week. We've got plenty of time. This is a long ass fucking show. But here is something that p- could take even more time than listening to this show. An audiobook on Audible. Dot com. Our sponsor for today's show is Audible. If you head over to audible.com slash cynical, you'll be able to pick up your free audiobook. It is the world's largest site for audiobooks that you can listen to on practically any device. They have apps on iOS, Android, Amazon Fire. You can run it directly off an Amazon Echo, which is how I listen to a lot of mine. I go That's into the I kitchen. I've got to have some breakfast. I sit down at the table and I yell at it. Alexa, play my audiobook. And that's exactly what it does. And we've got a couple of recommendations for you. But before we do that, I'd like to let you know that for the next week or so, they In currently... Whoa, there we go. That is the wrong button. They currently have a two-for-one sale. So you can spend one credit and you can get two audiobooks for the price of one. My pick for today's show actually comes directly from that sale. And it's called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, written by, <laughs> written by John Ronson. It is a book where this guy goes around and interviews people that have been subject to high profile public shaming, whether wow. it's down to like they have said something that's been quoted out of context, whether maybe they said something in private in confidence that was then spread all over the Internet and it, how it affected their lives and oh, how they God. dealt with it. Um, I think he did a TED talk, mm-hmm. with this guy, and showed some did. of uh, who some hasn't. Of yeah, but real. okay, yeah. A real <laughs> TED Talk, though, not a TEDx, yeah, yeah. a real TED. No, but this, this ah, one listed is, like, you know, one of the, the best ones, and it was absolutely fascinating what he was, you know, kind of saying, and uh, particularly, I guess, in our, not in our space, but just generally with, um, you know, anybody that's on, you know, watching Twitch or on Twitch, because you are in this, you know... Public, you're very connected uh, to that yeah, idea. You're very yeah. connected, you're very close, and you, you see a lot of it. So, and how it affected the people was, um, yeah, really, like, you know, let's say devastating but absolutely interesting to be you know without trying to tell you it's uh, very morbid for us in particular it's interesting to listen to in this case these stories because 
we've all experienced that to a greater or lesser extent, this idea of public shaming. We've said something that has blown up on the internet in some way, and we have faced down the angry mob online. So we're very connected to that. But from the perspective of someone that's not, I think it gives a very important perspective on the power of social media and the responsibility that we have as sort of digital citizens, I guess, as it were, to not fan the flames of that sort of thing and not give in to the temptation to be part of the mob. Yeah, right. and uh, there was one on um, like this lady who did a text before she got on the plane. So she made a text and it was meant to be kind of a joke. And then when she went on a 14 hour flight and by yeah, the time so she, she was got disconnected. off, it, it was everywhere. Know, yeah, it was, you know, and how it affected her is uh, it's, a, it's I would definitely, you know, recommend it. It's um, yeah, pretty scary. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's responsible for a number of things. Uh, you remember the movie? Maybe you don't. Uh, the Men Who Stare at Goats. He I actually do. wrote he wrote the book yeah. on that one. So and he also wrote one called The Psychopath Test, which is very disturbing, where he finds out a bunch of things about the essentially the mental health industry and how neurological studies work and whether or not there might actually be a big con going on in that respect. So yeah. 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 Juber and I had a, did we have a conversation about this the other day about uh, someone posted either a news article or a, uh, on Twitter saying that a, a friend was put in a psych ward because. Yes. And, yes. And, yeah, we and did. <laughs> it was, was kept in there. They wouldn't mm -hmm. let this person out uh, because his insurance was so high that the money they were getting, he was like, I'm fine. I, I, I don't even need to be here. And they're like, getting, they were getting paid need... so much they didn't want. I mean, that's yeah. that's literal enslavement. That's terrible. Yeah, Good God. That's, that's that actually that story was terrifying to me. Yeah. I was like, oh, oh my God, oh yeah, no you have doubt. to be really careful what you tell people. Apparently, when they're giving you psych tests because yeah. oh, was... they could potentially be like, ooh. Oh God. Yeah. There was uh, one person that ended up um, being on trial for something, and he decided that he would probably he was told by a friend that he would get better treatment if he told him he was you know a little Played bit in you know, insanity. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so um, and they uh, put him in a you know a psych ward, and they they didn't want to kind of let him go, and you know they were like, well, you know, even though he like seems really normal, they're like, yeah, but you know, it's very sociopathic to kind of say that you have something. God, that's wrong with you. terrible. <laughs> so what he did suggests that he is. Yeah, <laughs> should be in a psych ward when he was just doing it to try and find the best solution. That's horrendous. In the next three years, good then lord, he ended up staying there for like ten. Hmm. Speaking yeah. of interesting cases, your recommendation for this week, Dodger, comes from the vault <laughs> of Sherlock Holmes. It does indeed. Uh, you can now get what is it, sixty-two hours? Hold Damn. on, good yes. god, sixty-two right. hours of Sherlock Holmes goodness, uh, narrated, narrated by, by Stephen, Stephen Fry. Fry. That's. Mm -hmm. Uh, that might even be too much Stephen Fry for me. I'm not sure. That he's so that's... like he's so good at adding like characterization though. Like the way that the way that he reads the different characters is really good. Um, and if you're a person who really loves the Sherlock Holmes stories, but at the same time you're like, I just want somebody to put some new life into them because you know, they're the same story every time. By Arthur Conan it's... Doyle, yeah. They're you know, they're quite exactly. old. Exactly. It's it's so fun to have somebody sort of sort of breathe something new into them and Stephen but Fry does a really good job with it. Stephen Fry was absolutely exceptional at this because he was a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Yeah. From a very early age of around 10 or 11 where he actually joined like the Sherlock Holmes kind of fan group society and he knew so much about Sherlock Holmes at a very young age you know even before going into uh, Cambridge. It's I, perfect. I think I heard about that when he was on a trivia show. Oh, I, okay. think, I think that was like a weird piece of information when he was on a trivia it's show. Probably, once probably before, on QI, like, right? He probably brought awesome. it there. It yeah. might have been on QI. Yeah. 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 That but, that's a lot of Sherlock Holmes, and yeah, that does seem like Sherlock the Holmes and perfect Stephen person. Fry together is a big win. A perfect yeah, combination. That's and what I think. talk about fairly insane value. You can get that for one credit. That's sixty-two yeah. hours of entertainment for one credit, and of course, with the. 30 day trial membership, you get a free audio bit. You could grab 62 hours of entertainment for nothing if you head over to audible.com slash cynical right now. So feel free. Mm -hmm. And Jesse, you've been itching to talk about this book for goddamn ages, and finally it is here. We can talk about it. Okay. Is the one and only Thrawn. Thrawn's out. <laughs> yep. Written by Timothy Zahn, the original writer of the Thrawn trilogy. Uh he it's phenomenal. Like he is a genuinely great writer and has brought back this character into the new Star Wars canon and has done it in a way that is essentially evil Sherlock Holmes. 
and he goes around and like outwits everyone because he's a genius. And but it's he's so not good. even that evil. The interesting thing about this book is, and Timothy Zahn's been great at doing this, but he does it, I think, more in this book than any other. The Empire really is not actually portrayed as all that evil in this book. All the characters in it are part of the Empire, and they're just doing their daily jobs. They're just, that is part of the society they're in, and they don't inherently view it as evil. They see it as having certain problems, but they think that generally the Empire is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh... I, I will say this. My favorite part is the fact that ev the new canon, the new canon is so good. And this isn't a spoiler for any books. This is just overall. Um, everyone in the Empire is like, why the fuck are we building a Death Star? That is the <laughs> dumbest goddamn idea. What a waste of resources. If we build that shit and something goes wrong, we'll go bankrupt. Which yeah, is even like, the old canon was like that. that. They were it's like, so the, all the admirals were like, no, we can have 3,000 Star Destroyers instead, instead of what? this thing. Please, it's why? So I love that little thing they're adding to all the, like, expanded universe stuff now, which is like, the Emperor was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Emperor, like, wait, we built a second one? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, it's so good they're adding that in there now. It reminds me of that damn Monty Python. So like, and we built the castle in the swamp, and it fell down. Then we built a second one. No, it fell, it fell down dead so I could do the swap. The seventh one stayed up. It's like, no, you idiots. It's, it's so good. Yeah, everything. Shout out to uh, also Disney. This is weird to say. Shout out to Disney for making everything in new canon cohesive and work together to the point where um, the Thrawn book takes place clearly right before season three of Rebels, the TV show. So Mark Thompson, the, the guy that got to read the book, straight up just mimics almost to perfection Thrawn's voice from the, the TV show. Yes. So, like, kills it. I mean, it's a chicken and the egg thing for them because they already did the Thrawn trilogy and they had him read it, and that was the voice that everyone now thinks Thrawn sounds like. So when they did introduce him into Rebels, he sounded like that. So it's an interesting chicken and egg kind of situation with Thrawn. Yeah. But it is great. So, There's it's, uh, it's not action-packed at all. And honestly, I think that's good because action-packed audiobooks kind of sound a bit silly. Or and most of the time, anytime there's action, it's literally Thrawn sitting on a bridge just being like, how do I mess with everyone here? Yes. Because mm. I want to avoid people dying. So like, hmm. And then he just like Sherlock Holmes his way to something amazing. And people yeah. are just like, what? He's like, see you later, bitch. Based like, on the artistic like, ah! development of this race yeah. over the past 2,000 years, I can determine <laughs> that the behavior of this particular fleet of vessels will go something along these lines therefore it's, it's like yes yes this is great this is great more 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 please it's great yeah, you can pick up that it's fantastic and it's so well written. a like, ton of other star wars books star wars over there books and then there's timothy zahn so, and yeah, just like he's so just much better. better than everyone else just he so really good. really is and there are a lot of timothy zahn books and the vast majority of them i believe are narrated by mark thompson who's the best choice he does great impersonations of almost every major Star Wars character and doesn't make it sound silly. And that's impressive in and of itself. His Han Solo is barely recognizable as an impersonation. It's that someone's, close. Someone's asking if they need to read anything before Thrawn. You uh, don't. I mean, real talk for new canon, because all the old, like the old Thrawn books, none like of that matters anymore. It's yeah. all been removed. Uh, and they've redone his, his intro story. So like, He's in this universe. It's the same character, but like it's a new, they've all the old canon's gone. But the great thing about it is there's such a large gap between the original Thrawn books and this one. This fits with them. Like I listened it's to really the You're original right. Thrawn trilogy and the follow up duology prior to this. I felt like I'm getting a lot out of this as a result. But if I did it the other way around, I'd be equally happy because they don't massively change the character between the non-canon stuff and the canon stuff. It fits together, right. and that's great. There's just a big gap in years between them, so, so that kind of explains the slightly different mannerisms. But but real talk, if you're like, where do I start with the new Star Wars stuff? Straight up, it's only the new canon is only a year and a half old. So there's only so many books out there, and uh, it, it's if you find something you're interested in, there's books about leia and, and the aftermath of return of the jedi there's an entire new trilogy that takes place in the fallout like there's so many cool things that if you're looking for something there's even a love story look up lost stars if you want a teen novel lost stars is for you I do not, but okay they fall in love on the death star it's, it's a oh thing. god it's a thing that happens, <laughs> the thing that happens.
Check it out, folks. Audible.com slash cynical for your free audio book. You can play them back on practically any device. You've got some great features like speed control. So you're saying, I don't have the time to listen to a 14-hour audio book. Play it at one and a half speed then. You can get it a lot quicker. It will most likely not affect your enjoyment of it. You can absorb it quicker. They also have a ton of exclusive originals, short stories, comedy, podcasts, as well as the best of news and more, which is handpicked and continually refreshed. And of course, they're running that two for one sale right now. So head on over to audible.com slash cynical. And a big thanks to today's sponsors, Audible and Amazon Company. We will be right back after the break, folks. We're going to be talking about games we have been playing this week. Quake's coming up again, but I promise that will not be the entire show as much as I would actually be okay with that. We'll be right back after the break, folks. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the Co-Optional Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Co-Optional Podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed the sounds of Mick Gordon's Doom soundtrack. I don't see how you couldn't. It's that damn good. Rip and Tear followed by the rather wonderful... What was the name of the other one? It was one I don't usually listen to because it's not really, really, really damn heavy. But it is cool anyway. <laughs> It's one of not those more ambient. Enough. Yeah, it's not. It's one of those quieter, creepier ambient tracks. <laughs> I've got the name out of it, but all yeah, I can say is that soundtrack's creepy. great. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you're thinking more of like the ending song of Doom Two there, that one with the bunnies in it. Yeah. Although I'm not sure there was much like slap bass in that. I think that's you think no. it's swing right now, but you might be wrong. You might There's be no right. Seinfeld intro. I can't prove that you're wrong on this one. All right, let's get into some games we've been playing this week. Dodger, yeah. what have you been up to? What's been you going on? You want to talk about Dead Cells? Yeah, you've Yo. been playing the shit out of that, and we've seen Dude. that that game kind of popped out of nowhere and has got a lot of positive attention. Yeah, because we, um, we saw it on last week's release list, mm -hmm. and I think we were all like, wow, this game looks cool, nice color palette, like, could be, could be interesting coming out into early access, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I wound up streaming it thinking, okay, this is probably going to be pretty limited because, again, it's early access. Um, it turns out they released it on early access with 20 hours worth of gameplay. Wow. Um, Good amount. And said that within the next year, they want to double that, so have 40 hours total. Um, and it's great. Very Castlevania feeling to me. Um, in the game, you are a headless body. And there's what looks like just a collection of strange ethereal mold that kind of attaches itself to your body and becomes your head. Okay. And you are told by the NPCs like, oh, you're back. You've been doing this over and over and over and over again. So it's established like this isn't the first time that you've attempted this. It's like you've basically been doing this for eternity is kind of the way that it's pitched. Um, and you are killing these things just like you know all of these weird beasties and things that you find as you as you traverse through these different areas um sometimes they drop blue orbs that are called the cells in between each area you meet up with a really weird guy who's got a big tube on his back that when i'm playing i call dad because we see him all the time and i'm like hi dad He's not actually your dad, as far as I know. Not confirmed or denied in the lore. <laughs> um, but he asks for uh, cells in order to make you stronger. So you uh, basically trade cells with him in order to, game mechanics-wise, you, you give him cells and you can use those cells to upgrade weapons. Um, different baddies will drop blueprints for different types of weapons that you then pick up. And as long as you make it to the end of the level, then you're able to trade in those blueprints. Just because you picked up a blueprint doesn't mean that you have it. You have to actually like live through the level and give it to the guy. Otherwise it doesn't count and you have to go and find it all over again. Um, it's very, very fun. It's a really addicting game because it's one of those games where, and TB and I have been talking about this a lot recently, um, it's one of those games where you die a lot, but it has permanent upgrades. Progression, yeah. A yeah. Meta, meta progression aspect to it means that you never waste your time by doing yes. a run. So not only do you uh, really get to know the monsters that are at the beginning, um, there is there is a little bit of um, what's the term that I'm looking for, like some of it is generated on the spot, 
procedurally um, generated. Yeah, some some aspects of each level are always the same, right? Like you always know that at a certain point in this zone, there's going to be this thing. Um, but it's probably the between... best way of doing it too. Like it, doing it completely random for completely procedurally generated is in itself imbalanced. Well, people yeah. didn't like that with Strafe as well, I think. I think Strafe oh, God, I... kind of roguelike, yeah. but it really everyone was like, well, actually, it's just a procedurally generated... It's just a procedurally generated yeah. shooter, yeah. It I... doesn't have... The, the only There's... progression that that game has is you can earn parts of a teleporter, which lets you skip the first set of levels. Like, that's it. So I feel like... Right. I, I played a bunch of Strafe over the week, and I did not like it, but it uh, does have for a that good reason. Soundtrack. It does, yeah. Soundtrack <laughs> is good. So, I'm glad to hear that this. A good soundtrack. I'm glad to hear this game does the whole progression aspect better, because I don't have the patience for randomly generated quick death games where I have to go yeah. back to the fucking start if I've earned nothing. I mean, do it, people call this game then like a roguelike or a so, rogue some people are calling it rogue light? Yeah. So, Interesting part: the devs also described it as a souls light, which I've never heard before. What do you genre, and then you kind yeah, of what do you think about that, Dodger? As someone that's played a bunch of Dark Souls, when the dev says we're a Souls light, why do you think they claim that? Because people want games that are like Dark Souls. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't that's... think that it actually feels like Dark Souls at all to me. Um, it's it's dark and it's difficult, and if that's all that it takes to be like Dark Souls, then sure. Then that but means a lot of games are here. Yeah, it's... It doesn't Not feel specific. like Dark Souls to me at all. It feels very Castlevania to me um, in terms of like like feeling that each time you're progressing, um, you not only really get to know all of the enemies as you go through and can you know understand their movements and can really blast through them fast, which feels good for you as a player. Like I'm I'm understanding them, you know. I'm able to do this on my own merit. It's not just because I'm upgrading my weapons, but upgrading the weapons also feels good too, right? Um, so all of that stuff is really nice. And yeah, like each area, you you have a general idea of how the area is going to be laid out, especially if you've done it multiple times. So I know that there's a certain area where at the very end, there's going to be an elevator and that's going to take me to a certain section, but there's also going to be um, a little underground area that's going to take me to another section. Each zone typically has two exits and you get to know like which ones you want to go for. Um, but they all will lead to the same like bosses, like the same boss areas. And there are like big bosses after a few zones. I've heard there's two bosses so far in the current mm -hmm. levels. Yeah. So. I have not beaten the second boss, <laughs> oh, okay. but I have beaten the first boss uh, with a lot of bleed. I stacked a lot of bleed on that motherfucker and he died. Um, yeah. But it's I mean, it's a very very fun game, right I mean, now. I don't, I don't pick up a lot a lot of games like this because um, John probably knows I play mainly <laughs> esport games. Mainly <laughs> multiplayer, yeah. <laughs> the first half of the show for talking a lot of esports. Right. But, um, when I I actually um, was checking out Twitch and I I, I came across um, uh, this game and also you know just uh, like you know what people might talk about um, on the show and I, I kind of looked into it and y you what you say about Castlevania is also what the community is saying they actually like some of people are calling it Metroid Metroidvania yeah, yeah that's a term that's uh, been used for the last few years that a lot um, of devs have adopted usually it just means big ex it's probably 2d but it's a big sort of expansive level and usually it means you got to get a certain item to open like a, it's got a lot of gated content um good example of a uh, metroidvania game is guacamelee which is a very successful vita mm. game it's also on pc great game recommended to everybody and that was a sort of lucha libre metroidvania where you sort of did you were a mexican wrestler um but also kind of a superhero with spectral powers and stuff and a lot of that was like you need a specific move to open this colored door kind of thing right and until you get it you can't do that and they say that because almost all the castlevanias were based on that idea as well you can't open I this gate till you have this item and Me Metroid was the same too. I well, do think that both of those games are a bit less straightforward than this one is. Like, um, like when I was talking about Hollow Knight a while back, that like it literally gives you a huge map yes. and says just go for it. And whether or not you'll find the things that you need in order pr to progress in certain areas, like entirely depends on where you go first and how you explore the area, right? Yeah. In this, it's like zone. 
zone. Gotcha. Yeah. Zone. It's not one big so area. Yeah. So if you do need something to progress, um, it's very clear. The game will be like, you have to beat this guy. You know, you'll you'll stumble onto an area that looks very different, that looks much more intense, and it'll be like, okay, you're gonna fight this elite, what's called like an elite mob. You're gonna fight this guy and then you're gonna learn something from him and you literally can't go to the next zone unless it teaches you that thing so it's much more straightforward and much less um exploratory i don't i don't think that exploration is really focused on right. very much at all in this it, game it felt a lot of combat to be honest because like, when i watched a lot of people ton of fighting Twitch, the combat actually felt really it looked really tight and i could see mm -hmm. that there were a lot of um streamers in terms of their abilities that they would want to use that obviously had uh, iframes mm. know, visibility frames to you know fight and it felt like the combat was a, a huge selling point of this and all the variety and the weapons that you could pick up as you went along and how you could you know, uh, uh, fight people. Did you feel like combat was one of the bigger sell-up points for this for you? Yeah, um, there are definitely weapons that make you feel awesome. And I, I think that the controls are really, really tight. And there are definitely weapons that feel that they do a lot of damage, but they are slower. So you have to be really smart because you're gonna be locked into an animation, right? So if you like, there's a whip that I fucking hate but it's really it's really good against bosses because it's like if you're at max distance you will always crit. It's one of those type of weapons so you're like, "Oh, sick, I can keep my distance from this boss and just fucking whip the shit out of him." And, you know, it, it makes it a bit easier. But when it's against just normal mobs, say that you have like three different dudes who are all ready to charge at you and you're like, "All right, I'm winding up my whip now and I'm dead." <laughs> you know, like you have to be a lot smarter about which weapons you're taking in with you. Um, I wonder if that's a part of the Souls down. light idea, you know, the Dark Souls at times definitely said to you, you should probably use this kind of weapon against this mob or this boss as opposed to another. Maybe that's just the kind of mild inspiration. It's interesting that we bring this up because, of course, this is also the week where The Surge released, and there's been a lot of discussion around The Surge being a sci-fi Dark Souls, and generally the impressions of people, myself included, is that it does a very good job of doing that it's mm -hmm. actually a, a very very solid game but what interests me about what you're saying and what james pointed out is this is more combat heavy and less exploration heavy that to me is a selling point that's a big selling yeah. point because yeah. i didn't go for hollow knight because i found that exploration aspect so daunting i'm terrible at navigation it doesn't have that good it that's, feel at that's all good like for me yeah I might, I might play it then Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, this is why I, I think I'm going to play it as well, that I think they've done really well, because as far as I know, this is a very small studio in France. It's like a 10 to 12 people uh, motion twin. And one of the hardest things to do when you're a small team and you're making a game is that not it's, it's fine to come up with these cool ideas of mechanics of how the whip will work and how everything you know comes together, but making it feel yeah, awesome. Totally right. And, That's something and that a lot it, of people describe and, as yeah. polish, but really yeah, it's... Polish. You know, it comes down to a lot of different things. We talked a couple of uh, strafe actually came up in this very discussion because I uh, played a game called Strafe, but also one called Immortal Redneck, which is another first-person roguelite mm -hmm. where you spawn as a dude that has a set of first-person shooter weapons, some powers and stuff, and you go through these randomly generated levels and get different weapons and stuff. Then when you die, you spend your money to upgrade your skill tree. It's a little tree in the world, by the way. And then you go back to the pyramid. It takes all the rest of your money, like Rogue Legacy did, and then you play it again. And what the, my biggest problem with that is that the guns didn't feel meaty. And a lot of that comes down to oral and visual feedback, how the gun interacts with the enemy. In that case, all it does is it kind of flashes white a little bit. Whereas you look at a really good game, like, you know, the recent Doom, you're dismembering fools. You know, the guns yeah. sound amazing. They look Feels amazing. Great. Blood splatter yeah. everywhere. Yeah. That's also very important in this genre, like you said. Yeah. And just watching this, I felt like they really did a fantastic job on that. And there is something about, you know, the French, they're uh, quite arty and they do do things a little bit their way. And I thought they did <laughs> an amazing job with the particle effects. And as you mentioned before, when you said the color palette was good, um, Very vibrant. it looked like it was going to be really, really fun to play. And also when I was on someone's Twitch stream, um, the game developer was in there. So that's always a good sign for me when you think like, if you're going to want to play this more and you're thinking what could be happening in the future and they're saying they're going to do more content, you know, the game developers turning up in the Twitch stream from the french studio. i i love nice. when the devs show up in streams yeah. it's really yeah. cool 
yeah, it's it's it, so that was really nice to see, and that was I think I saw that at like eight a.m. this morning. He was up yeah. in someone's uh, yeah. stream on Twitch. So and sometimes, um, of course, it can get a little bit awkward. We had that happen with a game <laughs> that. <laughs> All right, oh, so, so we saw we got a, an email a few days before this beta went live for this game called Raiders of a Broken Planet, and it's by the studio that made Castlevania Lords of Shadow, which is a game I did enjoy quite a lot. And they said, right, we're making a four versus one multiplayer game where it's you kind of horde based, wave based co op objective thing, but one player is the antagonist who is working against you and trying to fuck with you. We thought, that it, sounds great. But they also, did they not learn their lesson from Evolve? <laughs> Apparently I mean, not. I, I, like I, mean... I love co-op, don't get me wrong, but like when you do a 4v1, there's always this kind of like, it's not as fun to just be the solo person messing with people. If you're nah, too I don't agree. People, I don't I agree. I love asymmetric gameplay choices, and I want more people to do it. I think so they're that just they going to do it right. Works. I just haven't played many good ones. I think when you were pointing out Evolve, the annoying thing about Evolve is that it's a fucking hide and seek game inherently. The actual combat is less important than the hide and seek aspect. In this game, you're not hiding as the antagonist. You have no reason to. You have infinite lives. Basically, your job is to go in and fuck with people as much as possible. So you go in there, you have the same abilities as one of the other classes in the game, and you fight them. So you sneak up behind them while they're trying to do the horde-based objective, and you fucking murder as many of them as possible. That's how I just it think works. 4v2 is the number I would definitely go for. I just think if you're messing with people, it's better to do it with a friend. <laughs> you're right. I felt, I, I, that's not no, because really, because you want to share that. And when, yeah, I, yeah. when I felt, when I looked at Evolve, and I know I, I can I'll stop talking about Evolve after this, but it's the only kind of 4v1. You know, There's I'm not many of, of them. I yeah. just felt like if, if I was a monster and I had another monster with me and we were trying to do this together, that would be, I, I'm down, right? But the, I can you're remember just so one solo, game that did that. Just, huh? I can only remember one game that did that. And most people won't even remember that this happened. Batman Arkham Origins had a multiplayer mode. Most people don't even fucking remember it had. And it was a three-team mode where it was like thugs versus supervillains versus Batman, I think, or some shit like Batman that. Batman and Robin together. Yeah, yeah Batman and Robin were working together. all of the other villains who were trying to kill Batman and Robin, but also had to fight one another. Yes. So that they didn't get Bat Batman and Robin free. It was great. Yeah, it was a really cool mode. I don't even know if you're getting play it anymore. I don't know if the servers are still up, but it was a really cool fucking idea. And like you said, you had someone else to work with so you could communicate with them and stuff. But kind of back onto this game, we, we really liked the sound of it and we looked at the videos of it and we loved the aesthetic of it. The character design was quite unique. It gave us a bit of a Borderlands vibe. I was like, yeah, let's go for it. We did not do well. It was not a game that we really had a lot of fun with. We got First, we, we got five people together and immediately realized you can't play the antagonist mode with friends. The only way you can play against an antagonist is if you queue as four, then you get a random dude in to be the antagonist. And that was way less fun immediately because we wanted to have somebody in our group of friends that were screwing with us because then we could all laugh about it afterwards, right? Whereas versus a random player, you just pissed. It's like, no, fuck this guy. You know, I bet he, I bet he doesn't even have a girlfriend. Uh, I, bet he, I bet he lives <laughs> in his fucking mother's basement. He's been playing this for nonstop for days. He's never so seen he, the sun. He, yeah, he, repeatedly. He, yeah, we, <laughs> it, it was pretty bad. But yeah, we, we just felt resentment towards him. But the, the <laughs> game had a ton of problems. That It doesn't have a traditional sprint mode. Most games, you hold down shift and you sprint. With this, they've made the sprint buttonless, which means you've got to run in a straight line and you will slowly accelerate to maximum speed. If you at any point deviate your course, if I even knock the mouse slightly, you lose all your fucking momentum. It's infuriating. Absolutely infuriating. And we actually had the dev in the chat, and I feel a bit sorry for it because we were hammering this game. Like, it had to be pretty I, rough. I felt really bad afterwards because I literally, I got so fucking angry at this game that I was like, I'm not having fun and I'm leaving. Yeah, you left. <laughs> you, yeah, she, she bailed on it to go play Dead Cells. I like... And that's that's not very common for me. Normally, I'll stick with it and be like, I'm having fun. I'm with my friend. I was having so little fun that I was like, I'm out. I, I hate this game. Yeah. And I went and I played Dead Cells and everybody was like, why does she look so sad? And I was like, I'm working <laughs> on, I'm getting the salt out. I'm playing Dead Cells to get rid of my salt. So that's how bad this is. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, we, we, had, we had a really rough time with it. Like the stuff that we're used to doing in 
co-op horde games, none of it worked the way that we expected it to work, and that wasn't in a good way. We're like, oh, this is innovative. It's like, no, this is just bad. This is a yeah, bad sounds, way of doing yeah. this. It sounds like what you say with the sprint thing. It's like you're trying to reinvent something that doesn't need to be reinvented. Yes, you're reinventing you're the wheel. Twist on something that doesn't, yeah, need to be, uh, you know, twisted yeah. with. So. And they've got this weird idea. And I was playing the worst character for this because I was playing the slowest character in the game who moves at such a slow pace. And I'm like, God, this is horrible. Like trying to reach an enemy to melee them was a nightmare. And you might think, well, that doesn't matter. No, melee matters a lot. Melee is the way that you get your ammo back. Mm -hmm. and melee is very powerful melee has a kind of rock paper scissors system where the grapple is an instant kill if it lands which means the antagonist is doing to you doing it to you all the fucking time constantly Plus, yeah constantly some of the elite enemies grappled. are also around instant corners. kills as well i'm around a fucking corner and he uh, grapples me through a corner are you kidding me oh god yeah it was infuriating and <laughs> <laughs> because I, my guy was so slow, when I ran out of ammo, I couldn't get into melee range to get it back. And there is a, also another part of the system where there's this weird, like, energy that people can collect that sort of transfers through melee death. And if you collect five of this energy, you get a big boost in power. And it's even required for some objectives, like get this energy to charge the generator, to do the fucking mm -hmm. thing. In order to get the energy, you've got to melee either you an elite melee. or the antagonist, who both could also insta-kill you if you press the wrong button. It's fucking infuriating. Here are things that I did like. I thought that it was smart that um, in order to reinforce that you need to be constantly thinking about being undercover, right? Instead of just like barreling in there. Um, the second that you're in cover, you recover your health really fast. Immediately, yeah. Um, so if you're like popping out, doing some damage, going undercover, popping out, doing some damage, going undercover, then yeah, you get a lot of health back. Problem is if you sit there and wait for like dudes to show up that you can melee, likelihood is there's more than one of them so you're gonna melee one and then the other one's just gonna kill you <laughs> it's just like it, it wound up being very frustrating and i know i i fully realized that while we were playing people like sam figured it out they, they like figured out the pacing of it a lot quicker than i did sam was doing really really well while i was just like i don't fucking get this game i don't understand how it works i hate i hate it was this. just very counterintuitive like, in many ways you've played a lot of games like this but the skills that you learned in those games didn't apply here so mm. you ended up being super frustrated because you died so fast i'm like what am i doing wrong i felt like i was dying the second i got to the battlefield like, I would just immediately die. And I was like, what's even the point? <laughs> like, what's the point? <laughs> I don't... So... Uh, it, and yeah. it, it's very character dependent. I When you left, I actually switched the character you were playing and I had a lot more fun with it. Because the character's very yeah. squishy, but when you master her really cool movement mechanics like, like jump thing yeah she can wall jump and then flip and that lets her traverse the level very quickly she also has a much faster sprint speed than the guy I was playing and if you mid reach maximum speed you get to do a slide which lets you slide directly into cover or into somebody once i started to master you, that i was jump, having way more fun yeah and with her when you jump if while in the air you like aim down sights time slows down it hovers, a little bit yeah like massive mm -hmm. like, like a new mass she, like, effect covers so that she can get some air shots off and does more damage if she's in the air yeah so there are like cool things that all of the characters can do it was just but a lot of them just don't feel good the guy i played to start with like i said he was super slow yeah. horrendous his ability was useless it was like a kind of repulsor thing which pushes enemies back it's like this i don't care about that like that doesn't it doesn't really do anything fun but the the no, sorry. Is there light at the end of the tunnel, though, in terms of, like, is it in beta? Is yes, it... it's it, the very beta. Like, very beta oh, okay. to the point where half the things in it were written in Spanish because they hadn't been properly translated yet. Okay, Spanish yeah. developer. Okay, yes. cool. Ve yeah. Very... As well. Yeah, <laughs> ve very beta, no doubt. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot that could be done. I think they've got to change that sprint system entirely to a more traditional one. If they want to do the whole ramp-up speed, that's okay, but make it toggleable. Don't have this automatic thing that 
turns off at the slightest movement of your mouse. That's because infuriating. The, the concept sounds very strong to me. It'll be something that I would definitely see myself, you know, playing with yes. other people because I love, you know, co-op games and anything that I can shoot with. But in terms of how it played in co-op, how much synergy and how much fun were you having just having to coordinate with each other? Very little alone? synergy, I found. That's the, like the abilities don't really synergize well with other they characters. Were just like solo abilities. Like yeah. You can do this. Yeah. yeah okay. And those are, some of them were really cool. Uh, what a Crendor was playing a sniper who can stick to ceilings, which was really neat. So he could f flip, bounce off a wall, which would then catapult him and then stick to a ceiling, kind of Spider Man, and then snipe dudes. So like, that's cool, but there's no real synergy with the rest of the classes yeah. there. You're just like, doing a cool out, thing guys, on your own. My people need me. And yeah. Then just... And it sucks because, <laughs> like, <laughs> Some people I mean, were obviously having a lot more fun than other people based on the class that they picked. And I was like, well, this, yeah. feel, this, doesn't, this doesn't feel good. Whereas there are definitely other co-op games where you need the other players because they yeah. fill a role that you can't fill. I didn't feel that with this at all, hmm. which is unfortunate. Some of the weapon feedback could have been better. Strippen was complaining a lot about the shotguns not feeling great and not doing enough damage, even at short range. Uh, the melee system, I think there's an over-reliance on it. And for slower characters who can't even get to melee without being gunned down, it's horrible for them. They've just got to wait for an AI to hopefully get close so that they can do it. And the insta-kill aspects of it, the whole grab kills you instantly if you don't dodge it, is a very frustrating mechanic for a multiplayer game, I think. It's easy to screw up. And the dodge didn't really work the way it was supposed to either. Sam kept saying, I hit the dodge button and it didn't do it. So it was a problem there. But I guess what they're hoping right now is is they've got elements of fun that people are going to like enjoy and then they're going to improve everything else. And yes, was there I hope so. Of, like, was there, I mean, obviously not for Dodger who just quit out the game. <laughs> she hated it. And decided to farm cells. But was there an element of like, they've got yeah. this one yeah. thing going that's going to be enough? Okay. The, the aesthetic, the presentation, the characterization could be really fun. But then again, we said the same damn thing about Battleborn and that didn't exactly work out all that well, did it? So that's obviously not enough to carry the game. Improve the gunplay, make the abilities more interesting, maybe give everybody a movement-based ability or escape, and then an additional ability that does a cool thing, like damage or heal or whatever. Um, and just, I want to see what the other levels are like, because they were all multi-stage objectives. So you wait, you wait through the levels like, do this thing, now do this thing, now do this thing, which was pretty compelling, because it shook things up a bit. Enemy variety wasn't that great, that needed to be improved. The progression system was maybe the worst part of it for us. It was so slow. How would so you compare slow. it? I'm, I'm curious, because uh, I know it's a 4v1, but how would you compare the core kind of co-op experience against like what Overwatch is kind of doing? Because they're doing these little story missions. Very similar, I'd say. If you take the antagonist out of the equation and the game does have a straight-up co-op mode as well, it feels like that, just not as good. Like yeah, a mass effect Overwatch, multiplayer. But Overwatch, not as even good. it feels great as a game, even those co-op missions aren't really like a huge selling point at the no, moment. No, they're not. They could yeah. be in the future for Overwatch if they push it more. But okay. Yeah, but I think if you're building a whole game around that, you've got to be very careful yeah, with you... that. You know, even like Mass Effect, which has one of the probably the best co-op horde modes in the industry right now, one of the best, still has a whole single player thing to go with it. If you're building a game that's nothing but that co-op, they're probably gonna do the thing free to play. I don't know if they will or not, but yeah, there's You've got to do that co-op extremely well. Otherwise, people are not going to stay playing it. And yeah, it's got too many faults right now for me to recommend it. I hope they fix those during the beta. Well, good luck, Spanish developers. It'll be difficult. No doubt. Let me drop you a game. Where yeah, you do it. That I think you will enjoy, Dukes. Uh, yes. any of us is it I... fucking weird? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It, uh, well, it, here's the thing. It is kind of weird. So uh, they finally... A while ago, the Jotun team did a Kickstarter for the oh, next game, Sundered. Sundered, yeah. Right. And uh, as a supporter of said Kickstarter, the Kickstarter beta came out, and I played that. Holy shit, it is take your dead cells kind of gameplay, and uh, it's a Metroidvania game where the premise is you are a young woman who is trapped underground in this crazy world where two factions have unleashed eldritch horrors that have warped them and so you're caught in the middle of this war between the two and uh you oh so have... it's outlast no <laughs> no it's it's metro i hate you it's, it's, <laughs> it's a metroidvania game is it a moba but, but it's a moba right <laughs> it is essentially done the exact same cool hand-drawn art style as Jotun. right and the art looks amazing the the worlds look really really cool the um, way the game basically plays is what you were talking about earlier. The idea that 
even when you die, you still, while you play, you kill things and you collect shards. And when you die, you go back to this giant monolith that's your sanctuary and you can upgrade your character to go forward and uh, wreck guys as you yeah. keep going through the, the game. And hmm. in its current state, you are, uh, those upgrades exist in like shield increases or health increases or attack increases. There's a few things where you can change stats on things and you can collect perks that will change the way things react. So um, one of them is your shield will charge faster, but you'll have less of it. Things like that, that you can find and collect. But the basic gist is that um, you are going around. Uh, there are mini bosses, bosses, all of them. The mini bosses are kind of what you expect in a Metroidvania style game, just like a sure. room with a boss. The big bosses are fucking, you know, the insane jotun style bosses that are giant and like come at you through the whole world and there's a lot of statues and crazy things you can find that um the world sort of pans out and you become really small next to and that's how you get different powers the weapons they give you in the beta are your uh blade which is dark force energy it looks awesome cool it's this blade you have then you have a giant gun and you have a double jump and a shield those are the things they give you and uh there's definitely more to come but that's sort of what's in this i think overall it's like a six hour sort of look at what they've created but it's not the whole thing and uh it's super fun the best part is that the after you beat a mini boss uh, i haven't beat the main boss yet but after you beat a mini boss you get a dark shard and if you take that dark shard back to one of the sanctuary shrines where you learned an ability, you can corrupt that ability and make a different version of it. So you can either go, I'm going to do this the good guy way, or I'm going to become this horrible, evil, eldritch monster beast. Cool. And you're okay. So you go from being this, this woman who kind of looks like she's dressed like Rey in uh, Star Wars to this glowing dark horror that just destroys people. And the... <laughs> crazy conceit of this game is that while the map is the same there are roving hordes of enemies that you'll randomly come across and all of a sudden you hear like like crazy shit or the sound will change and suddenly a bunch of these little tentacle guys will appear or things will start popping out of the ground and you either have to be leveled up enough to fight them or just fucking run just run and it's star they will kill you they will hunt you down and kill you and keep chasing you until you just get away. And um, most of the time you'll die, but then you go back and then you level up and then you're like, bring it on, motherfuckers. And what the game does really, really well, besides being that same level of Jotun infuriating, and sometimes you're like, what? Uh, what it does really well is every time you do something important to the overall story and structure of the map, one of the areas is you go into an abandoned building and you get attacked by these little robot meteor guys. And the crazy thing is, when you get to the end of it and you flip the power on, because you need the power to be on in order to activate all these gates in the rest of the map. When you flip the power on, the game immediately says, okay, you're good enough to do that. Let's add another layer. And what happens is hmm. robots activate in the world that now shoot lasers that go through levels of the maps. So they might not even be on the same screen as you. And all of a sudden lasers are starting to come down through the world. And so right. now that the lights are on, everything's waking up. And these giant ass robots are now shooting lasers. And so you have, while you're fighting all these whores, you now have to dodge the lasers. And you're like, God damn it. So then once I beat a mini boss, I was like, oh, cool. I've double jumped now. I'm going to go to this other area that I can finally get access to. You get there. Suddenly everything's a little bit harder and there's a new enemy there. And so every time you think I finally out leveled this shit, I'm going to beat it. I know exactly what I'm going to do. The game's like, fuck you. Yeah. Hey, dummy. We got you figured out. We know exactly how you're going to think and how you're going to feel, and they just crush you every time. And that's sort of the point, is no matter what you do, it, it's this overwhelming, you cannot defeat this unless you just keep throwing yourself at it. But it and still it, feels good, though, doesn't it? Because even though the games got harder, you got more powerful yourself. You didn't mm -hmm. overpower the encounter, but you felt like you got somewhere and that you're more prepared for it. And then, of course, it throws a wrench in the works, but you still felt like you had a bigger tool set to deal with it. Yeah, it, 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 it flows so well. I think when the game comes out officially, I think July is the release date they're looking at, but I think when it's officially out, there's going to be more things that you can put points into and more perks that you can get. And it also is when you get points, the more you spend, 
the more it requires. So you, you don't just automatically start out leveling things. You have to go back and actually work to try and be better and defeat these things or learn to sneak the hell around and not be a dummy and think you can try to fight something. Because sometimes you'll be fighting one thing and all of a sudden in the background you're like, and then stuff will start, and like shit will come out of nowhere. And you're like, what? What is happening? It's, it was a genuinely Sounds fun, dumb, intimidating. frustrating experience that looked beautiful. It's gorgeous looking. And uh, the, the world, when you stumble across a weird statue or a crazy room or a shrine, it has that, that Jotun feeling that this is overwhelming and you don't know why the hell you're, you're there. Like, what am I doing here? It's, it's pretty cool. I think this is definitely up your alley. It's something you should probably look cool. for. Cool, cool. I'll avoid that for that very reason. I actually do. I don't. I don't like intimidating. I can't wait to not play that game. I don't like single player intimidating. This world is going to murder you. Games I've found it's it's just the theme that I I get very apprehensive when I'm approaching a game like that to the point where it's not fun for me to play, and I'll actually make an excuse not to play it unless I have to do it for work. Right. And I found the same yeah, thing with Souls. Mindset though, TV. You need to be like I am the murderer. <laughs> Okay. I, I think you think I'm trapped in here with in. you. Yeah. I think You're it's trapped very in here with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Rorschach attitude to things. I think it's a very similar attitude to those that get ladder anxiety in games like StarCraft 2. Like they get so anxious about it, it's so that's so apprehensive that they make up excuses not to hit the Q button, you know? I have the same thing but with intimidating single player games. And that's I think why I don't enjoy the Souls games and Bloodborne and such as much as other people do. Well, I, I the one thing that I think will really nail it if you're interested even remotely in this game uh, for anyone watching is go watch the trailer. I believe they, they hint at it in the trailer. You slowly see one of the bosses coming together and realize it's kind of like the biggest thing you've ever seen in a video. You're like, how do you fight this? I love that I it was scale. Cool. You know, uh, Jotun, the pre their previous game did scale really well as well. And for a 2D game to do scale well is tricky. For obvious yeah. reasons, because it's a fixed camera perspective. The only other game I think that was doing scale well and will probably never come out at this point is Below by Cappy Games that have, we've been waiting for that for fucking eight oh, years yeah. at this point. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that game. Yeah, I played a couple of years ago at PAX and it felt really good and they did scale incredibly well because they used a very unique perspective on things where you were just tiny in comparison to the grand scale of the level. But that game, we don't know when that's coming out. <laughs> it's been at shows for years and... You know, hopefully when it eventually does come out, it's the best fucking thing ever, but we'll see. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see they're making a new game and it looks like it's got an interesting, unique theme to it as well. Yeah, I'm super excited. When I saw them creating that, when I saw the Kickstarter, I was like, here, just take my money, make hmm. something beautiful. And the fact that it exists now, I'm like... <laughs> cool. I'm very happy so to see that, many, yeah. Um, going on, on, on Sunday, how many hours of gameplay do you, do you think it was? Or uh, This, I, I haven't completed. I've put in uh four hours so far i was told the the it's a closed beta just to like test the concepts and i think it's they said it's supposed to be six but i imagine it's how good of a player you are yeah. but with that said death is a requirement like you have to die in order to level your character up so i don't know i imagine six, could be five six yeah. hours i they, saw probably the bosses and they look absolutely stunning right and like, yeah, uh, yeah, that's actually really, really. You impressive. should have a look I, at their I, previous I game. Uh, they did the same thing, but with like Norse mythology called Jotun, where you had to impress the gods to get into Valhalla, Another and that meant firing huge game. motherfucking really things. Yeah, that was really cool as well. Play, you got to meet a lot of the bosses because that looks pretty. Yeah, there's, there's. I, I know for a fact that there are three power ups, three mini bosses, and one big boss in this oh. sort of like demo beta demo thing, they're yeah. releasing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be hugely long as long as they include new game plus i think at that point now a game like that just begs for new game plus options i would think well i know the main game's gonna be much bigger but yeah uh, definitely i would agree that having a new game plus then go back into it with all of your abilities on would be a different experience entirely mm -hmm. that's that sounds pretty cool speaking of a game that has new game plus that i have finally got into i probably won't play the new game plus and i certainly didn't with its predecessor <laughs> persona <laughs> i finally done it it took me ages <laughs> No, no, I'm about 30 oh. hours in now, but I put about 30 hours in in the past week and I intend to be playing a lot more of it. For some reason, I just, I bounced off it initially, which actually is the same thing that happened with Persona 4. Mm -hmm. I bounced I off it. I saying that yeah. way back in the day. Because we it's a real Persona fucking Persona. slow start. And this one is even worse in that respect. They don't let you off the leash for at least five hours. 
It's like, and, and and it still pops up during the game where it's like you are railroaded down one particular choice for that day. You don't have any other thing you can do. And to me, Persona at its best is when you have the options to do anything you want. Like, how do I manage my time throughout mm -hmm. the day? That's the most compelling uh, part of it for me. <clears throat> yeah. I, I thought that the beginning of this game, while it, it still was very long, like the, the setting everything up aspect was like, what, five or six hours? Um, yes. I still thought that I, and think that Persona 5 did it better than Persona 4, because even though it's long, um, you're immediately thrown into antagonistic situations. Mm. Um, every other Persona game, right, has been like, here's the city boy go into the country, and then everybody at school is all excited about the new kid, right? And this one is literally the opposite. It's here's a kid from the country, who comes to the city and everybody at his new school fucking hates him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh shit, like nobody likes you. You have to work really hard to like try and fix this situation that you're in from the get go. Um, they like literally the very beginning of the game is like throwing you into battle, like like throwing you into a situation where you're going, okay, I'm, I'm learning the game. I'm learning the game like right now. And I thought that it was a much stronger start that helped with with that like five or six hour railroad that you had to be on. I won't disagree with you on that. No, I think that the opening dungeon is a very strong opening dungeon. And Persona 4 had great dungeons. Persona 3 has shitty dungeons because it's all based around the Tartarus Tower, which is this huge fucking 200 level pseudo randomly generated bullshit tower, which isn't anywhere near as fun to take on as the ones in Persona 4, which were all hand designed around specific themes based on the target's personality. Mm -hmm. which meant there were some outrageously cool dungeons in Persona 4, like the 8-bit one. The whole yeah. thing is done in pseudo 8-bit style, and they change all the music to chip tunes and shit, and the boss is, like, flat and everything. It's, like, huh. it's great, really cool. This game goes all out on that, making these palaces incredibly thematic. But, and I, right, I'm going to put the spoiler warning up now because I'm going to talk about a mechanic. I went into this game blind, not knowing what this game would offer in terms of systems and stuff, so mm. when this came up to me, it was a huge, pleasant surprise. And for those that want to avoid knowing about it, I'm going to talk sure. about... All right, I'll, I'll say what it is. I'll say what the word is because you won't know. It's not a spoiler otherwise. It's called mementos. I'm going to talk about mementos, okay? Spoiler warning is now on the screen. The fresh maker. Yeah. fresh maker. Anyone that doesn't want to know about this, mute it until the spoiler warning disappears off the screen. Great. So mementos is basically a better Tartarus, but as an optional dungeon that you can go into as many times as you want, that also is the arena for side objectives. And I was hoping when I heard about the premise of the game and beat the first one, where you've got a, your thieves that go into someone's mind and personality to steal their distorted heart to make them change their ways. Bullshitty, whatever, but, you know, whatever, it works. But then but they I've, also confess or something. Yes, yeah. they do. Um, <laughs> it either that or they kill themselves you've got to watch oh. out about that like it, it it's like well you they might have a mental breakdown and die in a psychotic rage or they might change their heart and confess their sins and show genuine remorse uh, you know which is a compelling story beat but the cool thing about mementos is it's a big randomly generated kind of underground dungeon where you can find minor targets who are like little side stories whose hearts you have to change like a bully at school or a guy who's stalking his ex-girlfriend and i thought to myself when i first played the game god i hope they have a lot of these because i am starting to dig the whole we're a group of heroes trying to prove our existence to the world by changing people's hearts for the better and i'm like oh, i hope they have a lot of stories like this and not just a few yes they do in a big giant fucking dungeon that you can grind if you want. So they provide that experience to you if you want it, but you don't have to do it outside of a tiny little story part. You don't have to go in there, but it's I great that you say, have the choice. Um, and I don't think that this spoils anything. It behooves you to do a lot of mementos. Yeah, because um, you're going to get it, experience levels and social link upgrades and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, the game will constantly point you towards mementos. Yes. And you can ignore it if you want, but it it definitely is in your best interest to make time to go in there. Yeah, um, I agree. For, yeah, for your social links, for your experience, for all of that. 
And I will say that I made the mistake of ignore, ignoring it more than I should have. Yeah, by the I'm end. investing quite a bit of time in it, but it's nice to also have an additional layer of time management because a lot of Persona is like that. Persona mm -hmm. is a social sim game mixed with a JRPG, which is what's really interesting about it because most games don't do that. And there's an element of time management. You only have a certain number of days. You're a kid, you've got to go to school, so you can't fuck, fuck around in the morning. You've got to go to fucking school. You have exams that you have to study for, and if you don't do well in them, your stats go down and shit, and the story elements associated with that. And I've got to decide, okay, what am I going to do with this time? There's certain things that happen on certain days. If you go into the bathhouse on a Monday or a fucking Thursday, it's a medicinal bath that gives you bonus charm. And it's like, oh, if it's raining, some crazy shit might happen here. And the special events that don't show up at other times. And that was fascinating to me in Persona 4. And they've expanded that in Persona 5. So you've got this giant fucking city to do it in, which is even better. So um, they, I'm loving it. They also it. Uh, brought back negotiations in this Persona. Which is yes, really cool. which is an element of... Persona used to be a part of the Shin Megami Tensei series, SMT. Mm -hmm. It used to be called SMT Persona. Now it's just this kind of own thing, but they brought back this idea of you can negotiate with the monsters in the dungeon. If you knock them down and kind of get them at your mercy, you can talk to them. Talk to them. Yeah, and you can like be, oh, give me a fucking item, bitch. Or you can say, hey, I, I want you to join me. I, you know, give me your power. And a negotiation happens. <clears throat> and um, each one has a different set of conversations and you can pass or fail it. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious because I I've never played any of these games and it sounds absolutely mental. It's um, mental. <laughs> it, no, it is. How, it is. Yeah. It's... Um, how weird does it get? I oh, mean, very super weird. Very weird. Super super. Is that super, kind super of weird. the appeal? But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like the the UI and the aesthetic is always really good, and every yeah, game I... expands on that and makes it even better. Um, and you don't have to have played any of the previous personas to play this newest persona no which there's I think, a few references here and there but that's about it but like it's it's <clears throat> so unnecessary um yeah but the the games are fucking crazy but they they work they really do work like they're very very fun to play you also um, have to be you have to at least have some interest in learning about japanese culture because it's very japanese like not in terms of mythology, in terms of you are a high school kid living in Japan doing the things that you do in Japan. You have to go to school on Saturdays. All the Japanese holidays are represented and special events happen there. You know? Thank God it's not. Thank God they didn't set you as a Japanese game developer in Japan <laughs> because then no. you would just be working the whole time. <laughs> Hellish. Yeah. <laughs> you totally. don't have time to do anything else. Um, so that's good they went. I mean, you're very busy as a student, you know, outside of the holidays. Mm -hmm. so you don't even get yeah. one day a week off. So you got to no, worry about I, all that yeah, shit. I, I, I kind of, um, you know, saw that it's the, currently the, you know, best-selling title from uh, yes. Atlas right now. And yes. You know, as we know, it's probably a quite a big team. And I, so I'd imagine it is pretty amazing to play and it seems it's really well received. It's very pretty, long. Like it's 70 yeah. plus hours for a playthrough. Oh, pretty much everybody I know has taken at least 100. Yeah, you can spend it. a lot more time in it. And of course, it's got New Game Plus as well if you want to do it. Although... To me, there New Game are... Plus and Persona's never really worked because it's very story-driven, so seeing the same right. story again is probably not what I really care about. There are apparently, and I haven't done a ton of research into this, but there are apparently a lot of benefits to New Game Plus to make it go way faster. Cool. Um, That's nice. Because there are specific characters, and again, trying not to like spoil anything, there are specific characters where basically their entire social link, their entire confidant like ability unlocks are all about helping you manage time even better, right? Because the game creates situations that make you go, that that like make it hard for you to do a lot. And so there are specific social links you can get that help you double down on what you're doing with like your evenings and things. It's an optimization um, game. It's very much a numbers game in yes. many ways. You know, you're trying yes. to do everything in the optimal, most efficient use of time possible mm -hmm. to get maximum so, benefit. Uh, New Game Plus makes those characters even more effective and effective quicker. Um, there are some characters where there's a, their abilities help you with other characters, right? Like if you really focus on this character, then it's going to help you spend like the time that you spend with other characters will Better, be maximized. Yes. Yeah, so it's it, kind of like a Pokemon like help. minigame as well, where you're creating these different personas, which are kind of monsters that 
cast powers for you basically that's how you get your magical abilities all mm-hmm. that kind of shit but yeah you're right it you you've kind of got to buy buying into the whole fantasy of your regular person who has the power of being able to express their emotions through special powers in a kind of world inside the mind sort of thing like and yet yeah. yeah. actually no. very much very, so yes, yes literally <laughs> that's right on the money it's a japanese inception that's what this game is Mm-hmm. it's weird i never thought of that comparison before yeah it's totally what it is that wasn't really what the other personas were necessarily but they've all had this sort of theme of discovering your true self and all that kind of shit they've all sort of been tied together that way but everything else is a very loose association but yeah it's so far i really really like it i'm actually playing most of it on remote play because i yeah you know, it looked great on remote play yeah from what you showed us last time it does so some people were saying, oh, you're playing on a Vita? Wouldn't that be a problem because the Vita doesn't have L2 and R2 buttons? Behold! It fucking <laughs> does now! I discovered they made a special case for people that want to do remote play. Amazing. Well, they did. They, it was a Kickstarter thing in Japan for kind of a Japanese Kickstarter or whatever. Huh. They manufactured only a limited run of them. The ones for the Fat Vita, which is the PS1000, which is the one I've got, rather than the slim one, which most people have. Mm. These cases are pretty rare now because they only did one production run and they sold out instantly. So it was kind of expensive. Although if you have the slim Vita, they're a lot cheaper because they made a lot more of them. This adds... L2 and R2, and what it does is it's a lever that pushes down a pad on the top of the touchpad in the zone where the Vita emulates right. R2 and L2. So it's a bit mm-hmm. of a long trigger pull, but it works perfectly. So now, thanks Great. to this case, my Vita has an L2 and an R2. So baton pass, a move that mm-hmm. I need, and you know, running, sprinting and stuff, I don't have to touch this back fucking touchpad, which also means I can use this for other games now. I, I want to play Yakuza 0 after I'm done with this. Because I've been watching Cry play that, and it's mind-blowingly fucking silly. That game's nuts. You have an entire (laughs) minigame. You have a fucking entire minigame managing a social hostess club in Japan and having to, like, refill people's drinks and shit. There's a bowling minigame. There's fucking shit tons of stuff in Yakuza 0. It's crazy. So I want to play that after finishing that. But yeah, remote play's been really good. There's been a couple of little hitches in performance. Just like the health of the Wi-Fi. Sometimes the Wi-Fi just decides it doesn't want to play nice. So you'll get a little bit of a hitch here and there, but mostly it runs really well. So I've been doing most of my play through that. Being able to play that in bed cool. is awesome. You know, just, you know, chill out, play it there, not have to sit in front of a screen. Great. Yeah, so big fan of the game. Hmm. Man, we're, cool. we're sort of already at 25 past fine. We just kind of keep going. We've still got more games to talk about. So fuck the news. There isn't really much to talk about. Should we just continue? We'll just, oh, unless, do, do we really need a break? Does anyone really need a break? I'm, oh, fine. I'm fine. We're fine to go? Mm-hmm. Cool. Shall we talk about Quake Champions and actually playing it then? Because sure. we yeah. talked a lot about the esports scene. We didn't talk much about the actual gameplay itself. I assume that myself and James are the only one who have played it. No, Go for I it, haven't. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can start, TP, because yeah, I don't okay. want to, like, sure, yeah. I don't want to. It's so obviously, uh, you know, I'm not a pro FPS player, but I enjoy online FPS a lot. But I've never really had the desire to play Quake Live on a consistent basis. When they made the changes to it, when they added all the new systems, like the loadout system and everything, I went back and tried it for a bit, and I had fun, but it didn't keep me. It didn't retain me as a player beyond a couple of weeks. I just, I felt, I don't know why. I think, it, I just, I was not compelled to go back and play more rounds of it. Whereas with other online FPS, I have been. And some of it comes down to being able to make tangible progress and unlock things, but other parts of it just come down to every game sort of feels the same. Every game kind of has the same sort of outcome. Nothing really changes, and maybe I feel like I'm getting a little bit better, but in Quake Live in particular, the other guys are often so much better than me. They've been playing for 10 years that they've solved the game, I guess. The the learning curve in Quake, and this this is something that is, um, I think, one of the hardest things that to keep the players everybody enjoys playing games that they're good at right of course it's yeah. very hard to get into quake and just be like i'm gonna be good after a few games you're not you're <laughs> gonna be good in quake and if you're lucky and the game is big enough you know like kind of a, a huge scale and the matchmaking's nice enough you might get a, you know if you play against people your skill you're gonna have a, a way uh, more fun time because you know a lot of people before this even came out were like oh it's gonna be 
an Overwatch clone and it's going to be this. Yeah, they um, heard a lot of things and, because it has yeah. classes and, and abilities. It, it's definitely a quake. It's still it's still at its core. It's definitely a quake, but it's adding um, these kind of new elements to hope to maybe solve some of the problems that Quake Live had, which is people played and then they didn't come back. And the ones that stayed were there because they purely loved Quake. Um, but so far, Quake Champions is definitely fun. It's definitely still Quake, but I'm not entirely sold on the kind of um, synergy between the champions and how you work together as a team. But I am quite happy, I think, um, playing the champions and how different they are in terms of you know, the fantasy role of like, I like playing um, a more snipery style gameplay. And there's a character called Nyx that I can actually just go completely invisible but it's not even invisible you actually just become like a camera so you can't even be hit when you're invisible and yeah, when it's you kind of phasing sniper, yeah when you want to play a sniper right that's like a, a really good ability that you would want to give to somebody to kind of live out that very sneaky snipery kind of um uh, play style and it's, i would i say sniper but i mean like railgun or rail yeah. it up. um you know and and some of the characters fulfill this fantasy okay, but they don't really do it together as a team. But if they did, it, I guess it wouldn't be as much Quake, because Quake is all about your kind of individual play style in your individual kind of space. But I've enjoyed it so far. I've really, really enjoyed playing. I just think there's a lot of stuff, of course, that they can and really need to fix. And I'm still massively worried that new players will come in, especially because it's free to play, and then just be like, yeah, that was fun, and then Move not on. come back yeah yeah it will be interesting to see how they do player retention they've done the overwatch loot crate cosmetic thing which is a way to try and keep people in there without doing a clear progression in power that would be a very bad idea in a quake game you don't want people who've played longer to be statistically more powerful as well as just better yeah. in terms of their skill level that's silly right they've got a few different game modes which i think will help i think what would really help is a weekly mode with a bunch of mutators on it like a, yes. like one week they do insta give one week they do freeze tag yes. one, one week they do crazy shit you know no reason Absolutely. not to and there's so much fun stuff that you can pull from from the quake kind of modding scene over the years right there's like silly games where you're actually i mean you can go like super silly but you can just do modifiers but there's silly games where you're actually just all um boxes yeah uh, in like a quake 2 mod and there's you're in a room in a warehouse and everybody's boxes and if you move you you don't you, you go back to human form but if you stand still you're a box so the idea is you're trying to figure out you know which that's like prop hunt actually... that's prop hunt right yeah like from uh, uh garry's mod yeah i think it started in um yeah like a uh, very early on in quake mods as well before it got kind of ported over but then of course you've got your insta gear but as you mentioned you've got your freeze tag uh which is a hugely popular game mode and i think freeze tag um I mean, we can talk about the game modes that they have. Uh, currently, they have Team Deathmatch, which is very standard, Team yep. v Team, uh, quite simple to get into. Um, then you have uh, your Deathmatch, or what they call free, you know, free for all, yep. which is traditionally, this has always been Quake's biggest um, game mode because you go in and you just shoot people shoot for fun. Shit. Yes. And then you just constantly shoot stuff. You, there's no, it's just like, you know, you're blowing off steam or you're just having fun. You hit an air rocket or you get a couple of, you know, kills back to back and it's fun. Feels but if good. you keep playing, if you keep playing free for all, you know, it, it doesn't feel like you're learning this, like there's a tactical game you're that you're missing or a meta game that you're missing. And then, um, so TDM and CTF has, has traditionally been our kind of, you know, big learning curves for team games in terms of, you know, tactics and coordination. But now what they've done is they haven't got CTF in yet, but they've got a menu with four game modes and there's space for two more. So who knows what will come? And they've done a new one, which is called Sacrifice. And to explain Sacrifice as quickly as I can, not to bore people, uh, you've still got two teams of four, like in Team Deathmatch. But after when when the game starts, you can still just like run around and frag people. After 20 seconds, there's going to be a soul that spawns in the middle. Now, by picking up the soul, by touching it, you pick it up. Once you've got the soul, there's two obelisks on either side of the map. So obelisk A and obelisk B. You have to take the soul to one of those obelisks and you can even throw the soul onto it or throw the soul to pass it to your teammates to try and get it there and coordinate you know a run like that and once you get the soul to the obelisk you have to hold it there for a certain period of time until you score a point and for the enemy team to stop that they need to stand on the obelisk or slightly around it there's like a domination point for like three seconds and then they themselves get the soul and they have to navigate the soul back to their obelisk you know 
So it's pretty much like a mix between CTF domination and TDM. Yeah. Um, and, it, and I guess it's in the hopes of its software trying to get people playing Quake in a more, not structured way, but in a kind of a rule set that helps people know where everybody, sh what they should be doing. If you know what I mean? Encouraging actual because, team play. Because Quake, yeah. in, in reality, a Quake, and this is something I said about Lawbreakers quite recently as well, when people were asking, well, why, shouldn't I, why should I just play this when I could play Overwatch? I'm like, Lawbreakers is not the same as Overwatch. Lawbreakers feels like a team game where everyone's playing solo. Like, everybody can mm. pretty much fight to an equal degree. There's no character like, say, Symmetra or, like, Mercy, who is probably going to lose straight up in a fight. Like, there's no big matchups that would be disastrous for one person versus another. It feels like a team game, but in kind of name alone. And Quake also kind of feels like that. But this mode, Sacrifice in particular, because it's a flag-running mode and a de attack-defense mode, you have to play more as a team. Because if you're farting around in the middle of the map, you're not helping. You're really yes. not. You're like, unless the soul's about to spawn there so you can grab it, you have no reason to be there. But you were talking to me last night about this, James. There's an interesting element of decision-making because, of course, Quake is about resource management too. So rather than attacking and defending, should you be in the middle grabbing the mega health or the armor or denying the weapons yeah. to the other team? Even though they're, yeah, I would say that even though the game mode is like, it's like, okay, they've got the soul over um, Obelisk A, you need to go get it. Because once it hits 100%, you lose a point, and then yes. effectively you've lost, you know, uh, the round. Yeah. Um, in Quake, there's also a, a huge amount of emphasis on just picking up armors, health, uh, and items before you want to attack. So even though it's trying to force people to kind of go to the Obelisk A, they're like, you should go there. You really have to think still in a quake way of like, well, if I if 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 one of my teammates picks up the railgun and I go around to the right and get the mega health, and then our last teammate, if we wait for him five more seconds, he's got the you know the heavy armor, then our attack is much more powerful. But to have that happen in a kind of um, you know if you just go in and play solo, you're not going to have. Uh, I think a real sacrifice experience, you know, because I've played the game mode with, um, you know, people who've played Quake for 20 years and we play in houses. So 4v4, um, we've been playing almost uh, every evening when I have time and the game is so much fun. It's fast, it's fun, it's coordinated, it keeps you on your feet and it's really adrenaline rush. But the, what I can see might happen is that the information that they give new players and how new players develop in the game they still might not be playing sacrifice as it was designed because it's kind of like overwatch overwatch did this great thing where it was like what the pros are playing everyone's playing everyone's ed getting educated in overwatch tactics and how reinhardt is played and how you know uh, tracer is played and they learn it very quickly and they learn from watching streams to learn the nuances of how to play sacrifice as a team, you know, to be, you know, to really be playing it, it's very difficult for me to imagine the community learning how to play it as well as the pros. But of course, it yes. is still nice that you're going in one direction. Um, and but when you can play at a level of coordination and and the game is really fun, so I highly recommend going and playing sacrifice with friends rather than. I, I was about to say that I I, I played I was, the mode. I thought yeah. the mode was great, but I was streaming and I was playing with puppies, and it was the fr most frustrating shit. Yes. I was like, why are you there? Like, no, yeah. we need to defend this. I'm like the only person attacking. What the fuck? Arrgh. Yeah, I, I watching you play was like a one v three v four. Um, and At one point, it literally was because everyone else left, and apparently you can't. <laughs> queue into yeah. a game that's already in progress they've got to fix that shit that's well, really bad yeah they're doing that i think a little bit but they're, they're you know that i mean there isn't custom lobbies like the pros want to yeah. train against each other right they've now got to, they've got to have a server browser and private service they have to yeah so what they do is they have to like they 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 go into a discord channel they all queue together and then they go they wait and they go oh did you get the queue? yeah and then if, if one of the guys got it and the other one didn't you go okay no let's try again and That's you're just terrible. trying to sync up that you get into the same game to start practicing because they are teasing that esports is around the corner but anyway i think it's a, a fantastic game i think it has a lot of things that they need to work on and fix and you know like net code uh you know there's like small nuances that really make um a game that's going to go from good to great, especially for the Quakers. But I do feel that the community is somewhat split over it just because they're delivering a very uh, tailored experience of you get to play this, this, and this. But Quake has always been, you get to play whatever you want because everyone's modded Quake. And 
as yeah. far as I know, there's no modding. Uh, the maps um, take like three months to make. They only got they're very detailed. Right now. Yeah, you know, they're all made just you know in Maya and in previous quakes, you could make maps in GDK Radiant and and so on. So whether or not they can get up to a good amount of maps on release, you know, of course it's currently beta, but so far it's just a lot of fun, and I'd highly recommend playing it just as you know because it is going to be free to play. But if you want to play the team modes, come in with friends, and you yes. hopefully will get a good time. But I will say the matchmaking is pretty awful. It almost seems like it just matches you up against who's ready to play now i think it probably as does in the beta right they probably don't as, have proper mmr yeah. yet as as opposed to like who's really really good but i think i think if it's you know it might just be constantly expanding matchmaking you know so if there's not someone yes. ready to play in your skill level it goes next five seconds you know and that it's kind of difficult because no one enjoys playing quake a game that is you know you can get destroyed in quite easily if someone's just five percent better than you anyway that's my rant but it's really good i've enjoyed yeah. it I, I i really enjoyed my time with it I, I think you're right on all points there um hopefully the main release of it does allow for private servers and private server browsers modding would be phenomenal because let's be honest shit like the original team fortress came from quake world that's the sort of thing that we need they spawn entirely new game modes the more flexibility they have there the better I imagine they probably can't do this in any way, but it would be really interesting to see if they could take Snap Map from Doom and somehow implement that well, I think as a way to build they, new modes. They ended up working with Saber, which is the Russian development team, is because they had so many people working on Doom when they wanted to start Quake Champions, mm -hmm. and they needed to outsource it because it's very strange to think of its software, you know, wanting to outsource some of its, you know, big franchise names and doom you know amazing that went well the second time round um, yes because there were two versions of that game um so hopefully quake is well received but i think doom was a really you know healthy for that company uh but i i'm still not sure on how the community is gonna um you know as you mentioned i think you mentioned like if this doesn't bring back you know kind of the arena fps scene after looking at all the previous games like reflex and toxic um you know quake live and its player bases you know who has to step up to the plate in terms of like you know it would have to be like a valve or blizzard and um you know not going to plug myself but we are like we're working on an arena fps game as well and the reason that we did it is because i see trends in esports which is like um people kind of like there's a gap in the market where you're like okay you can predict that the counter strike is going to be the next game and then you can predict arena fps is going to come back and then after this arena fps we're most likely going to see an rts uh hopefully warcraft 4 or, or something in the vein and then we yeah, might see an upgrade we probably will see an upgrade in a card game sometime soon because of Hearthstone's popularity and stuff and, and in esports people kind of go with these genres and it kind of recycles yeah so arena fps is currently on the table and, and available and, and we worked on a we're working on an arena fps game but we're working on it with a much smaller team because we don't deem that the player base is there anymore so no we're quite i don't think going it is either. development with 12 people and you know we think we can continue to support the esports scene after you know we release hopefully later this year quake champions i'm not sure if it's going to yield the results that they would want for a company that size but i hope whatever happens you know they continue to support it and you know development because so far it's it's a great game and the developers are talking a lot more to the community which is great yeah, I think what they'll have to do with it is they've got to cast a bit of a wider net when it comes to the audience, which is why I've said time and again, appealing to the arena shooter purists is a suicidal move in terms of actually making money. The numbers just aren't there. And I've heard arguments saying, ah, this doesn't count. None of these games count because they weren't well marketed. They're not for a big, big name developer. If only one of the big name developers would step up and do the exact list of fucking things that we demand. If only then millions of people would come out of the woodwork to support it. I don't believe right. you and neither do these developers. Yeah. And when it comes to Quake Champions, the changes that they made are as a direct result of current trends in what people like with multiplayer games. And right now, the hero shooter is the in thing. Right now, people have played games like Dota and League of Legends that are not FPS, but are based on classes with abilities. So they thought, let's put that in Quake, but let's do it in a way that makes sense for Quake, not in the Overwatch way of press button, everybody dies. But it feels like an upgrade, but a small upgrade, and maybe not enough because they were kind of held ransom by the name quake yeah true they you know can't I mean? go full on with it they can't you put can't, four fucking yeah, abilities and all like, stuff. Well, actually this is it's still gonna be, be quake 
yeah, it still has to be Quake. So um, in many ways, it feels like they're pulled between multiple communities I and, agree. And, and different people's expectations. So that's why they, I mean, it's still a great game and it's still Quake at its core, but is it going to um, bring in the new players? Um, yeah. I do think esports does have a way of helping games like this that are like, you know, very good and just very respectable in terms of, you know, this is, if you want to watch the best players, this is a great place to watch some of the best players in, you know, uh, esports. It's similar to like how some games are very famous in speedrunning. You know, they're they're the, the the games that are very difficult to speedrun. That might help, but um, at the end of the day, it's a business. They need sales. They um, need player retention out. in this model and in particular. Espe yeah, especially with free to play, and um, there's going to be so many people that are going to, tr you know, want to try. They'll try you buy. it. Yeah, and I think the model is good for that. The choice of either buy the box for the dedicated guys that know they're going to play it versus the guys are like, I don't know, I'll dabble. And then they dabble for free. They maybe say, I really like that champion or I like the look of that dude that just murdered me five times in a row. I'm going to unlock him. And you can rent for in-game currency as a try before you buy or you can buy and apparently you can also randomly unlock them in the loot crates that you get after games. I There's a chance of that. quite easy to get the first you know few champions i wanted but of course there were some cool cosmetics like uh, they put some stuff in like the quake world rocket launcher and the quake 2 yes Zelda. i love the look of that so, they've remodeled yeah. those i want those immediately did you see the fucking shogoth um or shambler head for ranger he can oh, have a yeah, giant yeah, dead shambler on his head it's like yes this is brilliant but the cosmetics are great because they don't really change the silhouette all that much the th yeah, things are very recognizable but, still. I mean, the cosmetics are definitely feels like a good start for them just to have something that's already there in this early in beta. But it does feel that they we're going to have to expand quite you know heavily on it. And you've got to remember, like even um, uh, Dota 2, that's always done great with cosmetics, they're starting to have to do quite uh, more and more silly things. I uh, remember yeah. a long time ago, they, they refused an item into the workshop because it was too silly and it was yes. an Ogre Magi. And now recently, Valve just released their own Ogre Magi, which is a very silly looking, you know, with crazy hats and all that stuff because they're just finding out like, you know, making they sell a version of cool stuff isn't going to be the selling yeah. point. And we have to do a little bit more fun. Totally. And Whereas, so, you know, with you know, Riot adopted the silly model pretty much immediately and they sold a lot of skins on the back of that. So did Smite, by the way. Smite still, in my opinion, being the best game for skins ever. The skins in that game are incredibly good quality. But I will say the visuals in the game and the gameplay, they don't really show off your cosmetics as much as you'd like. No, um, they don't. The weapon skins are very nice because they come with sounds. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of actual the visibility, it's tricky. It's a very um, fast moving game. Um it's yeah. it's almost like they want to put a killed by, you know, the the brag screen. They kind yeah, of want like to do that like to show them. just like not even killed by like have the camera kind of zoom into him yeah. and show them or whatever because you have 5 seconds every time you die if you respawn. Totally, you could do that. You know, at least you get to show it off if you're in the top 3 because you get on the pedestal, but that means you've got to be in the top 3. So, yeah, the, the more of that they put in the better it'll it'll value up the cosmetics. What they've gotten there so far is great, but the more the merrier for that. Yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot. I hope it does well. They they just they have those big things to fix, like you said, and they've got to capture that audience. I just I want to know where the guys, all the guys who used to play Quake, maybe on LAN or whatever, where they eventually migrated to, because I imagine a lot of them went to Dota or League, even though it's not the same kind of game. They still wanted multiplayer competitive, so they kind of migrated over there because that's well where everyone else is. A lot of people have migrated to Counter Strike. Some people migrated to Dirty Bomb, and you know the smaller FPS. Dirty Bomb's still doing really well, you know. It's doing six or seven times the concurrence of Quake Live right now after four years of development. It's oh, really, yeah, still doing really well on Steam. So, can you bring those people back in from those various places and can you keep them? There's the challenge. If you can, great. Yeah, uh, not sure. No, I don't, think, no, it's, no, it's, I don't think Quake champions will keep you for five hours a day like a Dota would or a League would or a maybe Heroes, not, you know. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm sure it will for, uh, for a few and it will be there, you know. Uh, you know, Quake for the next years to come, and that's awesome. So yeah, we'll see it's how just it goes. Good that there's, there's I just a modern Quake. Well yeah. yeah, so do I. I, I recommend it. It's fun. Try it right now. There's still a few days left of the baby. You can grab a key off the Bethesda website and try it immediately yeah. for yourself. Anyone else been playing anything else that they would like to bring up? Pretty much good. 
I don't really think I need to rant about Strafe. I've already put that in a video. There's a new, <laughs> Dota, there's a new Dota patch. You should play Dota again. It's... No, they buffed denies, and I'm bad at denying. I don't want that. But they that. also did this really good thing for competitive play. You know when they put in all the talents? They put in a, um, a minus respawn timer, and yes. now they've removed them all. Um, so I think the game has got a lot better just based off that one change it's better for watching but it's bad for yeah. me because i'm shit and i like that talent <laughs> and i died a lot yeah okay it's Our a message ice rock I yeah i'm sure he'll change it for rock. the shit players definitely yeah uh, then, then hey. we re then we ended the heroes of the storm territory again and we've talked a lot about that all right cool well those are the games that we've been playing this week there's a few others that i've played but i've already got videos up on my channel about those so i'm not gonna beat the same path on that one the surge obviously is out right now a lot of people seem to be enjoying that i enjoy what i played of it strafe is out and i didn't enjoy what i played of that so you can go find out why on youtube.com slash cynical brit if you wish we're getting towards the end of the show we had a lot of releases uh, jesse have you had time to do the culling on these I sent you them <laughs> three hours ago. You that didn't looks like a confident that looks face. Like, that looks like yeah, a, that, I didn't notice you send it face. Yes. That's, that's the expression it. of the NBA teams getting a $20 million <laughs> offer to join Ooh. the Overwatch League, and they're just amazed. They're like, look, this look, is too good to be true. Look, look, I'm going to say is, uh, I saw the list, and I, I was like, fuck, that's a huge list. I feel bad for Dodger. I just now looked out the bottom where it says, would you mind calling for this week? <laughs> <laughs> I said that at 2 37. So it was three hours ago. All right, we're gonna see it. We'll have to do the it on was, the fly. The list we'll was so big. The list was so big. I was like, fuck, I feel bad for whoever has to call that thing. I did <laughs> Oh god. I I don't know. I might I might skip it. I, I think we'll skip it then because it is massive and I don't want to okay. spend an hour on this shit, but we'll highlight a couple of the important ones. So we oh. can like uh, what? I've like, got one that I want to... Yeah, you, later, you, so. yeah, you've got one that you wanted to highlight on here as well. So let's, instead of doing what we regularly do, we'll all just kind of grab our picks out of this list, stuff that we've recognized. So big thing can that I came up... Can I get the list, please? Oh, do you not have it? All right, okay, yes. I <laughs> I can send that to you. We're I, so organized this week. Yeah, oh, we are. We are fucking mess this week. Uh, James, I just sent it over to you there. And Dodger, there we go. Yeah, so Thank we'll just do it that way this week. We're not going to spend... We're going to run through all of them because, yeah, it's just there's too bad. much. Too I'm much. The, the big release today, unsurprisingly, is The Surge, which is on PC, oh. PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. That's been I thought getting, you were going to say Injustice 2. I mean, there's that as well, but it's not on PC, so I don't give a fuck, and things that aren't on PC are irrelevant. But, no, if you wanted to mention that too, you can. But The Surge, yep. A lot of people have liked it. It's been streamed a lot on Twitch. I enjoy what I played of it. I think of the games that have tried to do Dark Souls the, thus far, the two that are the best of it are Neo and The Surge. So I think it's a pretty good one. And obviously it's sci-fi, which is a theme that Dark Souls clones haven't really gone into yet. So that would be something that I would recommend having a look at. The other one, the big one today that you mentioned is, of course, Injustice 2 which is on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. That's the new fighting game from NetherRealm. DC Fighters for this one. Mm. The first one was pretty good. I enjoyed it. I had a pretty fun campaign. I was watching people uh, sort of showcase Injustice 2, and I got to be honest, the animations that I did see didn't look great. There's been an interesting debate on that <laughs> recently. Someone put out a video, and everyone's mind seems to have changed to follow that video, that suddenly every animation that NetherRealm does is a pile of shit, whereas previously people said, oh, it's great, and every hit feels like there's real meaty impact to it. And now apparently everyone thinks that the animations oh. suck. Oh, I just mean like the cutscenes. Oh, that, okay, right. Oh, I'm talking about the actual fighting. The cutscenes are really just like... <laughs> to me. Everyone's like, look at their faces. It's like they're really talking. I think that's the big thing now. Okay, How, how's that a bad thing? No, I don't. I don't think it's bad. I'm saying that it's it's the opposite of what Dukes is saying. Okay. Well, apparently there's a disagreement on that one then. Apparently, find out your opinion on your own internet. No, they can't do that. They need just one of us to tell them what to think. They need us. I'm not going to be telling them because, like I said, it's on console. I don't really care. I don't really blame them because the previous Injustice game didn't do great on PC, but unfortunately, they have a pretty bad reputation for bad ports. 
Mortal Kombat 9 and 10 both came out in really bad states, and actually Injustice, when they finally released it on PC, was also pretty shitty. Netcode was crap, online matchmaking sucked. It had problems, so... You know, it's a chicken and an egg. They kind of fucked it up for themselves, really. So, I mean, I'm not really all that interested in it anyway. I never really cared too much about Injustice. It was okay. I prefer Mortal Kombat. Very similar games, but with a better theme, in my opinion. Hmm. There is one other game I'd like to highlight for today's release. Early Access, finally, Fire Pro Wrestling World is coming out on Early Access for PC. The legendary wrestling series that's been around for about 20 years is finally getting a new one after about 10 years of not having one. Coming out on PC, the best customization of kind of any wrestling game. You can make any character in it, do any kind of crazy match. It's coming out on early access today, and it's like an isometric, old-school like game. It's like playing on a Sega Mega Drive or a Super Nintendo. No, no crazy 3D graphics. I am very much looking forward to playing on that. So, yeah, they've got that today. Anything else that people spotted on May the 16th that looked interesting? No. We're I know doing it day by day, May the 16th. Yes, May the 16th okay. is what. There, there's one other mention. If you've got PlayStation VR, Farpoint is out today, which is a major release for PlayStation VR. We'll have a look at that. Yep. All right, what else was there? Let's see. I have one for the 18th, but I yeah. assume I'm going day by day. Is there, I, don't, I don't have anything for the 17th. Nothing there looked particularly interesting. Although, actually, no, but... looks like Ocean Horn is coming out for Vita. The second Ocean Horn, Monster of the Uncharted Sea. That's a good Vita game. Yeah, it's a very it's a Zelda-esque game that originally came out on mobile, was highly praised. And apparently the Vita's getting a version of it. I might get that. Great, cool. I'll have a look at that. What you got on the 18th that you noticed there? Uh... I have been looking forward to Old Man's Journey. Okay. I think the art in it looks fantastic. You literally play an old man who's going on a journey. <laughs> well, self-explanatory. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, in their little trailer, the art looks cute. The music is very, like, whimsical. So I'm sure it'll, because you're an old man going on a journey, I'm sure it's at the end I'm going to be like, my heart. But. Uh, I old also... Man's Journey through life and loss. I will avoid that. That sounds very depressing. <laughs> I want to play a non-depressing game. I feel yes. like Regalia of Men and Monarch, Monarch speaks to me. I've been hey, looking at it for a while. It's interesting you mentioned that because a mysterious package from Poland arrived on my doorstep a few what? days ago. Why do I get mysterious packages from Poland? <laughs> you want to get you want to get random crap that you promote on Twitter, like mugs and I toilet know. paper. They send me actual games. I don't know how they got my address, and it's creepy that they have it, but... They uh, they sent me a full box copy of Regalia out of nowhere and said, hey, we're going to send you a box copy. We really think you might like this. And I'm like, I'd never heard of this. I looked at it. I'm like, I probably would. It's a really cool looking cool. tactics RPG kind of thing. So kind yep. of Final Fantasy Tactics-esque. Uh, art style looks great. It's all hand drawn. It has some really cool aspects to it that I've yet to try, but I want to try it. One of the features right at the bottom is Samurai Dwarves, exclamation mark. So if there is a Samurai Dwarf class, what more could you want in your video games today? Nailed it. Exactly. Nailed it. Now you know what to add to your game, yeah, James, as you go that. forward. That is the key to success. Regalia of Men and Monarchs on May the 18th. There's also another one uh, that I noticed that I got an email about, Mages of Mistralia. I've heard about this a couple of times. It's a multiplayer magic combat game, I think. Uh, in a world of magic, your mind is the greatest weapon. Learn the ways of magic, create your own spells to fight the enemies. Oh, no, it's actually a single-player game. Never mind. But, yeah, it looked like a really cool magician combat game where you create your own spells. A little bit less wacky than Magicka, more story-driven. So I like that idea. I love the idea of creating a custom spell and then fucking wrecking face with it. That sounds really great. So, yeah, that definitely stood out to me as something that looks cool. Yeah. There's a new Cooking Mama game coming out called Cooking Mama Sweet Shop <laughs> on 3DS. There it is. Thank God. Of course it, there is. Yes. We have gone too long in this world without a new Cooking Mama. And now we have one. There's also a port of Thumper for Nintendo Switch, which was a game that came out on PC a few months ago, a kind of rhythm racer, which had amazing graphics, really awesome. So Switch is probably a great little place to play that one. So there's one for you. 
you had one, James, I believe, that uh, I think somebody it's 19th. that you know. What date are we yeah, on? we're on the nineteenth now. So, oh. yeah, I have one. It's um, I mean, this isn't something that I would normally pick up and play. I'll tell you why I'm going to play it. It's called uh, Skylar and Pluck's Adventure on Clover Island, and it's kind of mm -hmm. like a platformer, I guess, like in the Ratchet and Clank uh, kind of vibe or Banjo Kazooie. Um, but the main reason is, and it's a bit sad, is um, there's a school in uh, Sweden called Future Games, and it's actually one of the best game development schools, like reputation that I have really got to, you know, hear of and got to know. Um, they accept a lot of international students as well. So if you're interested in, in looking at uh, developing games, Future Games is awesome. And a lot of the students there, they go off to like DICE and Avalanche, um, Arrowhead, Starbreeze, and it, the success rate of kind of transition is massive because it's very hands-on. Um, and the the hardcore few of game of uh, students there come out and they make their own video games. And I've actually been quite impressed that this group of team, uh, the small team of students, Right Nice Games, have been able to put together what seems to be a very competent, uh, enjoyable platformer. Whether or not you know how it compares to the other platformers, um, you know that's for platformers who love it to you know tell me. But uh, I'm certainly going to check it out. And that's on the 19th, and I think it's PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. And it's also kind of interesting because I think the lead designer, when he started working on that, was um, 19. <laughs> and, you know, so they've done it for a couple of years now. So it's from a very young team. So I'm going to check it out and I hope it's going to be awesome. So if you're yeah. into platformers, that might be on your radar. Sounds pretty interesting. A very saturated genre. They're going to have to struggle to get noticed. Yes. But... We'll I think I think do. actually that was uh, one of the big things. I think when they were started it or they had the idea of it, a lot of stuff came back in. So I hope it's at a good price, if you know what I mean. I'm not actually sure exactly what the pricing is for it, but I'm sure it's going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than the uh, bigger um, platformers. So it might be still be worth people checking out, but we'll see. I'm going to try it. And it uh, looks okay. It does look pretty interesting. And go to future games if you want to make video games. It's Indeed. awesome. I get commission. Apparently. Uh, big release for 3DS. Fire Emblem Echoes: Shadows of Valentia Yo. is out. That's a that's a port, right? Like a, it's a remaster, kind of remake of an older Fire Emblem game. Uh, Fire Emblem Gaiden, I believe yeah. it was. Yeah, I've, I I'm gonna play that. I'll, I'll be interested to see how that one goes. Uh, we'll see. I'm hoping it's a bit less waifu than the others because it's an older one. So maybe they don't emphasize that creepy bullshit. So maybe. Uh, I believe it's. It's essentially Romeo and Juliet, except Romeo and Juliet lead two armies against an evil villain. Is essentially <laughs> that's fair. So it's like two factions that fight together, but they like fall in love. Okay, so I think that's what that plot was. I, I mean, remember. it's a little better than I'm going to whisper in your ear to wake me up and I have to blow on the 3DS. Oh my god, why did Is you do no? this mechanic? Let's not even do that. So that that looks interesting. Uh, this, there's a, reservoir, the, there's a the fucking real... Reservoir Dogs game coming out on May the 19th for some reason. Reservoir Dogs Bloody Days. I, I didn't it, know there was a Reservoir Dogs game being developed. Yeah, it kind of looks like uh, the old Syndicate game, kind of. Oh, uh, the old Syndicate game, as yeah, in the like top-down old... isometric Amiga game? Mm -hmm. Ooh. That was awesome, the old Syndicate game. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, have you played Satellite Rain, James? No. Recommend it. It's uh, the, a lot of the original guys that made Syndicate and Syndicate Wars kickstarted Satellite Rain. It's been out for about a year now. It's a really good spiritual successor to Syndicate. Okay. Well worth a look. But if this is, if it's a Reservoir Dogs game like Syndicate, where I guess you're pulling off heists and shit, that sounds amazing. I hope it doesn't suck. Very odd that they bring it out now. It's like, well, that's a relevant license, but I guess Reservoir Dogs never really was irrelevant, right? Right always relevant in our minds but you know uh what we keep ignoring what, what are we is the, the best release that's right on the 19th which is the infectious madness of dr decker the fuck the is new, that the new fmv game by oh. the creators of contradiction oh. i'm so excited <laughs> jesse and i have been so fucking excited for this game <laughs> there's been a few fmv games that came out lately I noticed mm. some people were playing them on Twitch. They're like, where the fuck did these come from all of a sudden? Are people actually making those again? There was that one, like, The Bunker, I think was the name of it. And there was another one that I think Cry was playing where you seem to be a car parking attendant in a London car park. Yeah, we, we talked about that one on the release list. What was the name of that? Can you remember? I can't even remember, but nope. we talked about it. Was it Deadline, maybe? Uh, something like that? No. No, it wasn't that. All right, I can't remember what it was exactly, but... 
yeah, I'm looking at this and there are some weird ass fucking looking characters. You play as a psychiatrist trying to yep. solve a murder while treating the unusual patients of the recently deceased Dr. Decker. It's no Detective Jenks, but it's very close. It's very close. So always <laughs> hold a place in my heart. Mm. Oh, you t so you yeah. type a question and the patient's reply in full screen video. So that sounds a little bit like her story where you're having to type in the things to search the police database, right? Mm. It's much like contradiction. It's much like contradiction, like contradiction where you had to find the contradictions in what in the people statements. say. Yeah, they call them out on it. You're like, get out of here, you. And the Are you guys all like, going to play that? Do pot in my backyard. You're like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you don't, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Lying bastards. Yeah. Late, yeah, late shift is the name of the other one. Quite short, late I've been, shift. but it, yes, people don't like that it. That is right. Are you going to do a playthrough of the infectious madness of Dr. Dagger together? Is that a thing you're going to do for video? Maybe. Maybe. All right. Maybe. Keep an eye out for that. Yeah, that, that was about it on May the 19th of stuff that looked interesting. There's a great Gatsby game coming out on the 20th. What the yeah, fuck is going on this week? Too. What is, I don't even know what that one is. The Great Gatsby Secret Treasure. Why does that seem like a... It's a hidden object game. game. Yeah, it's an item search game. But they made one about the Great Gatsby for some reason. Oh, all right. I think it doesn't little, end well. I Spoilers. No, I imagine it's going to miss well, the point. Guys. I can't wait for the um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird hidden object game. <laughs> or the fucking Catcher, worse. Catcher in the Rye hidden object game. <laughs> or something more about the Handmaid's Tale hidden object game. Oh, Jesus. Why? Yeah. Why? Because apparently nothing is sacred when it comes to hidden object games. Evidently, because there's a Gatsby one now. That's about it of stuff that I noticed yeah. on the list that looked yeah. pretty cool. I don't even have the list because I'm a guest. I Damn. sent it to you. <laughs> Did you? No. Yeah, I, I sent it to you. <laughs> We're I a went... mess. Uh, I'm the mess here. It's okay. No You're surprise. a guest. You're not expected to know. Jesse is at fault here. We will hold him accountable for this. I Outside of that... Am. And oh, of, you did send me the list. A couple of betas that are out this week. Of course, we did mention Quake Champions, but the open beta for Dreadnought just went out today, apparently. Oh, a game that, game that we have fun. played. Yeah, it was a while ago that we played Dreadnought. I liked it, I but it felt, a, since, yeah. it felt mm -hmm. a bit simplistic to me. Like the game mode needed something a bit more than just spaceships shooting each other and then the round ending. So yeah. I'm hoping they've come up with a more interesting mode than that. Otherwise, I'll be happy to get back in my really fast defiant like gunship and cloak and strafe motherfuckers with it. It's going to be great. Can't wait. Mm. That'll be I'll good. I'll be your tank. I will slowly work my way to the battlefield. Indeed. And That's then ro nice rotate track. my abilities to constantly gain health back. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty much it for releases this week that we noticed on the list. We, you know, that format actually worked quite well. Maybe we should do that again in future. Like that everyone mm -hmm. just kind of looks through the list beforehand and then brings a few of them to the table. Maybe yeah, that's I mean, better. like, uh, be organized. And yeah. respectful of uh, content. I mean, for one thing, that sounds like exactly <laughs> the opposite of what Co-Optional is about. But the, the, the thing about the other one is that we get to stumble across shit and potentially laugh at it for being terrible so there is that we might there miss out that. on that look maybe we also have to pick one that looks awful and bring that too sometimes i find that maybe your uh what do we call them now complete cookies or brownie bears i don't brownie know brownie bears, oh, bears. <laughs> the fuck is a brownie bear i don't know oh, <laughs> some, uh, your community Excuse are really me? good <laughs> that sounds like some weird fringe cult terminology my brownie bears. <laughs> like, Ugh. I don't know what's going on. Um, but anyway, I sometimes find that when we did this on the, the Good Show a long time ago, when we did a talk show, um, the community are really good at just telling you all the weird stuff that you need to talk about. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if uh, sometimes it's nice to... I don't know how they would be I'm able sure to... I'm sure we rent, can get some but, help from the Total Cookies, yeah. Because yeah. It... basically, uh, mm. just... All the, yeah, Total <laughs> Cookies. <laughs> It wouldn't be out of the possibility to toss that release list out a day early in public and then see if anyone likes, like, oh, you should look at this or this looks Yeah, but it's, it's like, yeah. um, you know, like, they used to use straw poll, right, a long time yeah. ago. And uh, that was always nice, but I don't know. The problem uh, is the list is like 100 games long. I'm not sure you can straw poll that many options, can you? But 
It's not a bad idea. Like, we could probably yeah. do something like that. Yeah, I've always. I mean, thought, the I mean, trouble this... is when we did it on the show and we they they got to choose what games we played. That was a oh okay because that's a I had to idea. play Train Simulator. Oh, for about three hours. So as long as it's something that you just have to like you know talk about and you know yes. maybe give, like a a couple of what the fuck is going on here um, game. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. You know, and they that get to nominate good. this week's what the fuck's going on here. Yeah, that's 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 a pretty cool idea. I might steal that. Thank you for that. Thank you for your free consultation. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, Yay. thanks. If you do some, if you do something, we'll never do it for free. But hey, we'll take it. Yeah, this segment's always been the shittiest part of the show. Honestly, like I've never really liked it. So yeah, if we could change it and make it less shit, that would be good. And we might not lose a bunch of viewers. But then again, what would also be nice is if we didn't have Twitch fucking up for the last half an hour of the show. It's been dropping frames and lagging and all sorts of shit for the last half an hour. So apologies to those who are continuing to listen. If you watch the VOD on YouTube, none of that will be in it because we record separately. So if you want to catch it there, that's fine. Otherwise, thank you for tolerating the stop motion cameras we've had for the last 30 minutes. At least the audio has been fine. Mm. Yes, like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. Cool. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end of the show. So the only thing left to do is to tell you what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, if we happen to be participating in any, I don't know, major convention events that may or may not be in Atlanta, Georgia, possibly. That kind of thing. What? But first things first, James, thank you very much for coming on the show and spending so much time talking with us thank today. You thank so you much. for yes. being a guest no, that it's... speaks. It helps a lot. <laughs> I, and I, I try to interrupt uh, people based off how much I like them. Um, so if you go back and watch the VOD, the more I interrupted you was the more I liked you. Um, so I don't believe you for a you second. Were mostly interrupted. <laughs> um, I think you're trying to sow the seeds of discord in our group here. Um, yeah. And then, um, but no, it's really nice coming on and, and hanging out. And um, you guys do an awesome job. Um, you have no idea how many people that I've met in indie game development or just game development in general that have been kind of, you know, affected by how the new wave of um, a kind of entertainment game entertainment has affected them you know the likes of you guys you know Jim Sterling and you know people that are giant bomb so it's uh, it's really nice and uh, there's a lot of admiration from a lot of people I meet over here in Sweden uh, for what you guys do and as I got a lot of excited messages about you guys being well, me being on co-optional they're all very excited for me I personally, Aww, didn't, give a, I personally didn't give a shit <laughs> <laughs> the pleasure is all yours that sounds about as far right as I'm concerned but um, you know there's a lot of fans and uh, you guys are doing great so uh, really happy Thank to you. be here it's good to say. Are you planning on doing anything the next couple of weeks? Maybe streaming or I'm anything? I'm just going to play a little bit of Quake Champions. It's, it's super exciting. I get to play with the friends that I traveled the world with when I was like 20 years old because we were all cool. professional gamers. And so we're all playing together and having a lot of fun with that. And then hopefully in the future, I really would love to do some more Dota 2 because I really miss the community. But whether or yeah. not that's going to be possible uh, when and where, we have to see. Hope but so. yeah, just looking forward to some Quake Champions. And I recommend if you play it, play it with a team. If you play it by yourself, play just Deathmatch. And yes. start there. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Jesse, what you got coming up on the channel this week? What's going on? Yo, uh, you should tune in to see some of the new cool things I'm going to play. I'm going to start doing more uh, random fun games. Uh, and You've started a new series, right? For I that? did. It's called Cox Tees. I just yeah. play a little bit of a game and then I quit. It was a good... Uh, it's a good name. I'll give you that. It, it is. Just... It is a good name. And uh, maybe... Wink... Maybe you'll see Dodger and I uh, investigate together at the end of the week. And then, yeah. and then, uh, a little thing called Momocon's coming up. So it y'all is should indeed. Go to that. Yep, you should be because we are going to be there. We are doing several panels, folks. And Momocon's great because there's a giant fucking theater for us to do them in. Like most of these conventions, we get some fairly small rooms packs we generally get a pretty big one but it's quite uncomfortable for people this is a full-on fucking theater with leather seats and everything it seats like two thousand people we'll never fill it but byob yep yeah, it's a really really bring your own cool buns. thing may the 25th to the 28th in atlanta georgia it's anime it's kind of an anime convention comic convention and a gaming convention the gaming side of things is very much expanding we're all special guests we're going to be running two different panels ourselves we're doing the co-optional podcast panel and we're doing the co-optional lounge the co-optional lounge being where we play board games social games in front of a live audience this time around we are bringing super fight the game that sent me to hospital and the one and only snake oil 
which I think should be very entertaining. Very great audience games. That should be a lot of fun. Come attend both of those panels if you can. I believe there's one on the Friday and one on the Saturday. Do check the Momocon schedule for specific information. I'm also doing a solo panel talking with Total Biscuit. That's going to be happening on the Friday as well. And we'll be doing a official signing directly after the podcast panel. So if you want to come get your shit signed and get photos done, we can do that. That's going to happen too. We'll all be there. It'll be great. It's running 25th to the 28th. Yeah. I do not believe that tickets are sold out. I think you can still get a ticket for it. And it's a pretty cool con. I went either last year or the year before, and we really enjoyed ourselves. So, yeah, it's going to be great. And if, of course, you can't be there, there'll be a stream. All the panels are going to be streamed this time. So that's also great. Nice. Outside of that, I'm not really doing a lot. Although, Jesse, we are planning on doing something, possibly next week if we can. Fingers crossed. I, yep. I played a, the board game Star Wars Rebellion with the missus a few days ago. Finally learned how to play that. It was an awesome, awesome experience. We're probably going to try and do that with Tabletop Simulator because, you know, we're both big Star Wars nerds. We've played a Star Wars competitive game before and it was a lot of fun. We're going to hopefully play the board game. So that would be a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do that next week. Will you be doing cosplay, though? W knowing him, he will be. <laughs> Oh. Yes. I have an entire bin of Star Wars props over there. <laughs> Don't even because, tell me. props. Because I can I've do. also seen uh, Gina having um, Star Wars cosplay. Her Star Wars cosplay is something I don't think I would fit into, but she has a lot of really good stuff. Yes. Put that helmet on. Maybe my head's a bit big. I don't know. If I can, I'll do it. All right. That's a terrible idea. I'll be in that for three hours. Idea. I'll be sweating my head. No, no, idea. no. Okay, I take it back. Just maybe a cape or something would be fine. Yeah, yeah, just a cape. Dodger, what you got coming up? Um, what do I have coming up? We finally put out a new box talk, so there will be new box talk episodes coming out. Um, I do news shows, although I've been having some technical problems. So uh, hopefully, we'll get an anime news episode out this week. And um, I stream a lot, so you can find me on twitch.tv slash dexterity bonus and dex bonus on pretty much everything. Actually, yeah, my Twitch is now dex bonus. My bad. Uh, yeah, we're starting up some sponsored Stormblood stuff as well. Oh, Final uh, Fantasy 14, yeah. Final Fantasy 14 yeah. comes around. So I'll be doing that with um, Sam and JP and Aurelian and whoever else wants to join us to fucking farm ponies because Aaron and I are <laughs> adamant that we're going to farm some goddamn ponies in that game. All right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, sh it should be fun. Um, if any of you are looking forward to Stormblood, because you should be, because it's the best MMO. When does it come out? Um, Like middle of june i think uh, june 21st like or 22nd this is before the storm yeah the mm -hmm. storm the this calm is... before the storm oh uh, uh, okay oh i thought it was clever that's why it took me a while to get it <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much us done. Thank you very much for watching. If you happen to be a subscriber for the stream, we apologize for the shit state of the VOD. We'll be, it'll be up on YouTube on Thursday without any of those problems. There are also a couple of other VODs from streams that I did over the last couple of days. You can check out The Surge is one of them. Quake Champions is the other. First half of it, we had some frame rate problems because fuck Windows and fuck the creator update for breaking everything that we yeah. finally now resolved. I hate you for that. Hopefully that will never happen again. Once again, big thanks to our special guest today, Mr. James Too Good Harding. Thank you very much for your participation in the show. Follow thanks him on Twitter. Him. His Twitter name's been under his face for the last three hours. You can't miss it. Go and have a look at that for frequent updates on it. It's down. It's down. I right. Know. It's, I it's know. there. But. This has been the Quackshaw Podcast. Big thanks to the sponsor for today's episode, Audible, an Amazon company. Check out audible.com slash cynical for your free audiobook that may or may not be thrown and probably will be thrown. We will see you the same time next week, folks. 3 p.m. Eastern. That is 8 p.m. in the British Isles, 9 p.m. Central European time, 10 p.m. Eastern European time, 12 p.m. on the West Coast. Nailed it. For the Quackshaw Podcast live on twitch.tv slash Total Biscuit, we are done. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>